Oh, I guess we have interviews first. Yeah. All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, first up on the agenda tonight, we do have interviews for various boards and committees. Uh, so I'm just going to go right in the order that we have them. Is Brenda Durand here? Brenda. Um, is John McDermott here? Linda Grenfell. Hi, Linda. How are you? Um, if you want to just take a seat here real quick, just front and center. So this is something new that well, we started doing this year. It's just for all um, reappointments. It's uh, just an informal conversation as how your time has been so far in the Conservation Commission and why you'd like to continue to serve as an alternate member. I have loved doing it, and I continue to serve because it's good for wells and for the planet to be saving land. Any questions from the rest of the board for Linda? Thank you very much, Linda. Uh, Appreciate it. Quick. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Very Thank you. Much. Thank you. <laughs> and Owen, you're up next. So, Owen, same question for you. Uh, just reason for continuing to want to serve on the Conservation Commission. Uh, I'm in my 41st year, so either I've been wrong up to now, <laughs> I should leave, or I can keep at it. So I'll keep at it. I think that's a fair answer. Any questions for Owen? Oh, thank you, Owen. I appreciate it. I thought you guys called me here to renegotiate my salary. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about that later. <laughs> I'll pick some of See Thank, Thank you, Owen. 41 years. <laughs> uh, Ken Lowell. Ken, how are you? Um, same question for you, except with regards to the Shellfish Commission as opposed to conservation. All right, so. I am just uh, happy to do my part to um, you know keep the conservation end of the uh, you know, claim committee going and uh, you know, do whatever we can to try to get some youth involved as well. So. Awesome. Thank yeah. you. Any cool. questions for Ken from the board? You're doing a great job in the new building. Oh, thank you yeah. very yeah. much. It's a great, thank you very much. Beautiful. Great community project. I'm yeah, happy to is. be a part of. Definitely. It's awesome. really, really very nice. Awesome. Kind of be a nice addition to that. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you, Ken. Right. Have a great night. Thanks, guys. You too. Maynard Bridges. So same question for you. Uh, just reason for continuing to want to serve on the Shellfish Conservation yes. Commission. Yes, I'm, I'm going to stay until I can't go walk. <laughs> good answer. <laughs> Any questions for you from the board? Again, good job on the, the building down there. Thank you. You spent a lot of time down there, and it's just really do, it's a great job. It's beautiful. I put, I put everything I got into it. Yeah. Yes, no. every day. <laughs> every day. Yeah. We appreciate everything you do for sure, Maynard. You do an awful yeah. lot down there. What's that? I said we appreciate everything you do. You do an awful lot down there. Well, even on days where it's, you know, five degrees, Maynard shows up in his, his thermies and his gloves and he's ready to work. Even on days where he flips his car on the way here, <laughs> he shows up just now. <laughs> Don't bother me. I'm I know. <laughs> typical Bridges fashion. <laughs> yeah, I'm used to it, so so I got I to gotta keep going. I'm 82 now, so I'm, I got to keep going. Yes, I hear you. Bless you, man. Almost didn't today. <laughs> <laughs> Had bad luck. <laughs> more than that, Keith Maynard. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Okay. We'll, uh, be in contact. Thank Finally. you. Thanks, Maynard. Yeah. Thanks, Maynard. Brenda Durand here for John McDermott. All right, so uh, we are going to go to a brief executive session just to discuss the various applicants in the back room, and we'll be right back out in just a few minutes. So thank you. So we undo this now? Yeah, just so it's not at the end of the meeting. When they come out of the conference room, we can bring some of those chairs in here. Okay. 
and this one about all the it would come through this pipe down the carriage. I like the way to a pond Okay, so good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Tuesday, March 1st, 2022 Select Board meeting. First up on tonight's agenda is Municipal Officers Workshop, Business, and or Public Hearings. The first being a public hearing on cluster subdivision ordinance amendments. Um, Mike, you want to tee this up for us? Good evening, yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, we have uh, several proposed changes to the cluster residential cluster subdivision uh, ordinance, and uh, this was discussed previously by the Board of Selectmen separately, the Planning Board separately. There was a joint workshop between both boards together to brainstorm uh, different issues with our existing cluster subdivision ordinance and how to address them. Uh, the Planning Board uh, was sent off on the mission to look at the language of the ordinance, revise it where they thought was appropriate, hold a public hearing, which was held. The planning board voted four to one to forward the changes to the Board of Selectmen. And so the next step is, is tonight for the Board of Selectmen to have a public hearing on the zoning, proposed zoning changes, take public comment, and then, um, and then uh, probably wait until the next meeting to forward it to the ballot because we have to put it in the form of a ballot question. Um, but certainly take all public comments today. If you had any revisions, 
that those could be done and uh, and uh, appropriately changed for the actual ballot question that you could vote on at the next meeting. Um, to summarize the changes, uh, minimum lot size was is the most probably the most significant change in the rural zone where there's no municipal sewer available. The uh, minimum lot size was 20,000 square foot, and the proposals to change that to 40,000 square foot. Uh, that would better accommodate septic locations, well locations, and the distances that you need to, to get between those two features of a non-municipal sewer lot. Also would provide a, a larger lot character in the rural zone, which seems to be desirable. Um, we also changed or proposed to change in the RE and RC districts to go from the minimum lot size of 20,000 square foot to 30,000 square foot for much the same reasons. And again, that's if not served by municipal sewer. Uh, street frontage requirement was going to change. Currently, a cluster lot can go down to 50 feet of street frontage um, on any street, whether it's a street within the cluster subdivision or a town road. And what the, I think the townspeople have observed is the cluster lots on a town road create a very dense developed um, visual impact to the town road area. Uh, so the proposal is to change the street frontage requirement just on town streets from 50 to um, 150 feet. And that would spread out the driveways and have a less impact to uh, vi visual impact to the town roads. Um, also buffers along a town road uh, would be defined as, as double the required building setback and be a no cut vegetated buffer. Um, again, to minimize the visual impact of development along town streets. Um, another item is a change to the multifamily development standards. Uh, there's currently a density difference calculation between a multifamily development and a cluster subdivision development, and we made the language match both. So the density requirements for both a multifamily and a cluster would be exactly the same. Um, we had some housekeeping language changes to do to the density in the AP district. There was some confusion in two different sections of the cluster ordinance on, on what is allowed for density in the AP district, so that language was cleaned up. Um, also, there were references to specific maps in the existing comprehensive plan, um, and those map titles are going to change most likely with the updated comp plan. So we keep the reference to um, valuable wetlands and environmental features Keep that reference, and we've kept that reference to the comp plan. We just took out the individual map identifiers. It was listed by map number and map title, and those are most likely all going to change. Um, but that section still refers to the comp plan for, in regards to granting a density bonus or not. Um, <coughs> also, another change was in uh, the vested right of the applications. Uh, we have nothing in the ordinance that says when a plan for development is fully vested. Um, we do have in the ordinance specifically stated that a pre app or a sketch plan is not vested. Um, so we added language stating that at preliminary plan submission, um, that a subdivision application would be considered vested and grandfathered at that point. So that's a summary of each of the ordinance changes, and of course, would welcome public input. Any questions for Mike before we open up to public comment? I know we had received a couple questions about um, the vested rights, and um, I know there were people that were concerned about what sort of ramifications that would have to change the definition of vesting. Is there any um, input that you could provide us that would help us make a decision on that yes, one? Yes, we've received a couple of emails in that regard. And um, legally, and it's really regulated by case law, and there's some statute that supports it, the statute says a development is vested uh, when it's received a complete review by the municipality. Um, a complete review in case law varies a little bit. Um, some uh, courts have decided that vested rights are based on when a local review authority like the planning board deems it complete. Um, other court cases have determined that it's after the first public hearing. So by case law, it's usually one of those thresholds. The language we propose is that when a developer submits a full preliminary application. So application fee, plans, um, all the informational requirements that are part of our submission requirements, um, at that point we consider it vested. And that matches very closely with, I think, what the state statute calls for and what case law supports. Okay. Was there anything else I had any questions for Mike? Thank you, Mike. Uh, we'll now open it up to public comment, public hearing. 
anyone that wishes to speak, just come up to the microphone and state your name, please. And just please try to keep it to three minutes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ben Rogowski. I am a uh, uh, landowner here in the town and, and the butter to the proposed Chick Crossing subdivision. And uh, I've got a statement that uh, represents a group of people that we've got here tonight. Uh, we represent a group of Wells residents, including abutters to the proposed Chick Crossing subdivision, many of whom are in attendance. We're here to support the proposed ordinance changes regarding cluster development standards and appreciate your time and effort discussing the topic. As a group, we stand for prioritizing the protection of our natural resources within our town. Our natural resources are one of the most important attributes that our town it makes Wells a desirable place to live and vacation. They provide a place for us to gather and recreate. They provide drinking water and they strengthen our town's economy and support wildlife diversity. Without these resources, our town would lose much of the appeal that makes it desirable. Town code designates a rural district and states its purpose is to maintain the open rural character of the land within the district. We feel this rural character has been lost in recent cluster subdivisions on Hobbs Farm, for example. And we are concerned that future cluster subdivisions in the rural district will also negatively impact the rural look and feel of the neighborhoods. Our group supports the proposed items being considered within this ordinance, including changing the uh, rural district cluster lot size to 40,000 square feet, increasing the street frontage to 150 feet on town roads, and requiring the natural vegetation buffer along the streets, in, including their increased setback from town roads. We believe each of these proposed items will help support and strengthen the existing town code related to the rural district. Our town also designated an aquifer protection district and states its purpose is to maintain and protect Branch Book Aquifer, which, pertains, uh, which provides drinking water to the town. Our group supports the proposed ordinance changes indicating that all land within the aquifer protection district shall be included in the common land or open space and that all stormwater facilities and development shall be located outside of the aquifer protection district. The proposed ordinance change also adds language regarding a subdivision subdivider's vested rights for preliminary applications. If the addition of section 202-8 part C is understood correctly, it indicates that this preliminary application would be vested upon submission rather than upon approval. This is a condition that we strongly oppose allowing vested preliminary rights upon application due to the significant impact those proposed ordinance changes would have on cluster subdivisions. In closing, we'd like to reiterate <coughs> our appreciation of the time and effort putting into amending the cluster subdivision ordinance. We believe these changes will have an extremely positive and lasting impact in preserving our town's natural resources. We look forward to the opportunity to vote in favor of this ordinance change on the June ballot. Thank you. Is there anyone else that wishes to address the board at this time? Mr. Hall. Uh, good afternoon or good evening. Um, my name is Howard Hall. I live at 10 Bittersweet Lane in Wells, Maine. Um, I, I haven't gone through all the details of the changes. I've made some calls into Town Hall. Um, I just wanted to um, communicate some things um, that I think the board should take into consideration. Um, I'm a developer um, and I do cluster developments. I currently don't have any projects right now in Wells that I'm even contemplating. Um, but one of the things that um, I would vary a bit from the gentleman that spoke earlier, I think that there are some very reasonable um, requests that are being made in this new, uh, the new changes in the language, uh, specifically for viewscapes on, on, the public, on the public ways, buffer areas in the public ways. Uh, but one of the things that... Um, I think is could be problematic or challenging um, is when you're looking at um, larger tracts of land, which you know we typically do. Um, with those, you're building in away from public ways, not necessarily on public ways. And when you're doing so, you're building a private infrastructure. Okay, adding the size of the acreage per lot 
I think is a, de a detriment to the development. And the reason for that is a couple of things. Number one, you're adding more infrastructure because you need more frontage because you have larger lots. Number two, you actually have less open space, okay? Because you're now taking land that the developer not, might not necessarily want to actually allocate towards the lots because you're trying to get things, you know, in a tighter cluster. That's one of the reasons why you do cluster development. And by doing so, you have less open space or larger tracts of open space. And that was one of the things that cluster developments were originally intended for. So you'd come in, you'd provide density into an area that was based on what you should have been able to get by right. And then the rest of that land is set into some type of a preservation. Larger tracts of land is better for animals, it's better for recharge areas, et cetera. Um, so one of the things that I would hope that you guys would consider um, is I, f I fully support what, what, the, uh, what the planning department has done with the viewscapes on public ways, increased sizes on public ways, buffers on public ways, because if you're in a rural area, you want to have that rural feel. But if I'm driving in 900 feet into the woods, no one in the public is going to see what I'm doing 900 feet into the woods. It's only the people that live there. Part of the, um, the concept around cluster development is new urbanism where you're actually trying to bring the homes closer to the streets instead of further away, which actually helps build tighter communities because the neighbors actually get to talk to each other from the road in the front of the house instead of being, you know, a half an acre out back. You're talking about going from a half an acre lot to an acre lot. So there's some aspects that I think from, a, um, from an environmental standpoint where you've got larger tracts of land for animals and recharge, especially in an aquifer area. Um, number two, you're adding to the cost of development, okay? I mean, cost right now for housing is incredibly high, and this, this potential change could actually add a lot more to that. I know that when I had a discussion earlier with uh, some staff, they said, well, the road length could increase by up to 30%. Well, the last project that I did, you know, was uh, 2,800 feet of road, right? So you're talking about 30% of 2,800 feet. So you're talking about another 300 feet, 600 bucks a foot. So it's not only the cost of the road, but it's the cost of the stormwater management and the infrastructure you need to put into it. So one of the things that um, could be an effect that people might not have thought about is what's the incremental cost now that will have to be put passed on to the home buyers. So I just wanted to bring those points uh, in front of the board. And you know, I'm a resident of town. I've been here for 10 years, but I grew up here my whole life in the summertime. Wells is a beautiful place, and I totally support protecting that viewscape, 100%. Um, but if you're out in the middle, you know, like I said, 900 feet in, no one sees it but the people that are buying. So I feel like it is a little bit of an overreach. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hall. Anyone else from the public? I don't know, Jason Labonte with Home Innovations. Um, so I'm kind of looking at, I'm not against what you guys are trying to do. I see what you guys are trying to do. The community is kind of speaking up, saying, hey, um, I've actually been to all the planning board, not the planning board meetings, but the comprehensive plan meetings um, to kind of get an idea of what people are looking to do. I mean, I build houses, so I kind of want to see what people are looking for and want um, and trying to problem solve to figure out how to get there. Um, so the biggest thing that I keep hearing, and it's, it's funny cause it's brought up here tonight and it got brought up twice at the last meetings on the comprehensive plan meetings is Hall Farms Road, right? Um, everybody sit back and say, oh my God, this is what Wells is turning into Lego Hobbs Farms Road and this and that. And so kind of like what Howard said, the biggest problem that I'm seeing everybody's relaying to is the existing roads and seeing it built up like that. You know, it's changing that perspective, that view. You're driving down the back roads. Oh, my God, look how beautiful the countryside is. And also, bang, you got 15 houses right, you know, side to side to side. Um, and, you know, I've, I've worked in a lot of other towns, you know, Saco, Biddeford, Kenny Monk, um, you know, a lot of the coastal towns and stuff. And, you know, you guys have a great thing going. You know, the whole purpose of the cluster subdivision um, is really, you know, to preserve nature. You know, I mean, you try to build the houses without impacting Mother Nature, right? 
You give somebody a hundred thousand square foot lot, what are they going to do with it? You know, they can cut the trees, they can have a wood stove, clear, the whole, clear cut the whole thing, do whatever they want to do, but you're really taking away that environment for the animals, right? The biggest thing that I notice, I mean, when we're building a lot, you know, we're only going back about 140 feet. You know, we only need about 100 to 150 feet wide, depending on how wide you really want to make the lot. You only need about 20,000 square feet, 25,000 square feet, you know, to have a really beautiful lot. Going to 40,000 square feet, this is what's going to happen. Me as a developer, I'm going to go in and say, okay, I need 100, 125 feet wide. This is how wide it's going to be, and I'm just going to have to go back 400 feet. Who's going to use the 400 feet? The 40,000 isn't going to gain you guys what you're looking to do, right? You guys, the whole, the whole problem right now is, is the view, right? Going down the back roads, you don't want to see a million houses, right? So if that's the case, then why don't we protect the existing roads? So say, hey, you go down Hobbs Farm Road or Bragdon Road or any of these roads and say, you know something? If we're going to subdivide off the main roads... You know, let's do 150 feet of road frontage, um, do a little bit of a tree buffer coming off of it. But the subdivisions coming off of those roads, they're dead end roads. Nobody's going to drive down them but the people that are living there. So what we do in Bidifid, Bidifid requires a 50 foot screening. So in other words, if you, you know, we're going to be cutting in a road, that's all you can cut in is a road, but we got to leave 50 feet of trees going down the existing road. So you're driving down the road. You don't see all the million houses. All the houses are down on the end of that dead end road, but you're not going to see it from the main roads going in. So if you keep the cluster subdivision rules as far as on the inside, you know, the way they are now, that keeps the tight containment way bigger open spaces. I mean, we just did a project that was 38 acres. And, you know, and a lot of people don't understand cluster subdivision. If we can only get 12 houses on the 38 acres because of the current zoning, when we do cluster, we're still only getting 12 houses. We're not getting 30 houses. But what we end up doing is we take those 12 houses and we build them within a 6 to 12 acre area and we give up the other 20, 30 acres to the animals. And that's really the whole purpose of cluster. It's to protect them, not us. You know, so get off the main roads, get into the cluster areas, build inside there, and keep that nice little community that we have in there and just screen the big roads that are going by. Because like I said, every single meeting I've gone to, everybody complains about Hobbs Farm Road. But it's an existing road. You know, that's where if they didn't have 25 houses on Hobbs Farm Road and those 25 houses would have been on a road built off of it, nobody would be, nobody would be here complaining today. And everybody would think that, <laughs> well, it'd still be looking pretty good. And everybody laughs, but, you know, Howard makes a good point. You know, we started... If we have to start going longer roads, everybody knows Wells doesn't like to take over roads, right? So the last road I just did was a million dollars. So 12 houses, $80,000 per lot just for the road. Not buying the land, that's nothing else. And then everybody has to maintain this road. Who's going to pave it in 10 or 15 years? You're going to have 12 people taking care of a road that's 1,000 feet long, and they have to repave it, resurface it, and it costs another sixty, seventy thousand dollars 70000 Well. Do the math. That's five, six thousand dollars per person just to repave it. That's not plowing. That's not maintaining or anything else. You know, at some point, you know, we're sitting back. Us as developers, price of wood and everything's going up. We can't stop it. We have no control of that. Everybody thinks we're making a million dollars, and actually, our profit margins in the last two years have been worse than they ever been because everything's escalating without us knowing what's going to happen in two months. Right? And now, extending roads, making them longer. You're going to see log prices go up 30, 40,000. I guarantee it. You put this thing in and you're going to pretty much put everything right to a dead halt. Um, as far as markability, you know, as far as your kids being able to buy affordable house in Wells. And that's the other thing I keep hearing. Oh, how do we get affordable houses in Wells? This is not going to help. Take this right, take affordable housing and just throw it in the trash. Um, but there's other ways to accomplish what you guys are trying to do. And I think what you're doing here isn't the correct path. And I'm all for change, obviously that's what I do. I'm all for change, but I think there's a better solutions on how to do it and keep everybody happy, including you guys. You know, I mean, we're not trying to say you guys are all wrong. We're just trying to say there's a better middle ground. You know, and I don't think tonight's meeting should be voted on based on what you have in front of you. Because I don't think there's been enough time to figure out that middle ground. 
and I've been on a comprehensive plan, um, and I've been working, I'm part of one of the tag groups, trying to figure out what direction the town wants to go in, you know, and, and I've been to meetings where it's only a couple dozen of you guys, I've been to meetings where there's 100 people, and we're all talking about the comprehensive plan, and if you guys want to get involved with that, show up. I've been there, I'm a builder, and, you know, we're not seeing as many residents. I mean, there's thousands of people live here, but only less than 100 people show up at the meeting. You know, so, but I think the comprehensive plan meeting should be where this is at, not not sitting here and trying to push us in two meetings. So, I think this needs to be thought out more, and I think you guys need to be taking your time on this. So, but that's my opinion, and good luck with it. Thank you. Is there anyone else from the public that wishes to address the board at this time? Can I ask Mike a question? Yeah, right after this. Um... Hello, my name is Mary Jordan. I'm a resident of Wells for the past 22 years. I'm also a member of Team USA from the 2010 World Equestrian Games in Kentucky, and I was a Paralympic alternate for London. We're hearing a lot about how much it's costing these developers to build roads and extend this. I can tell you from a practical point of view, living in the neighborhood involved, that over the years that I've been there, the horses have been pushed off the roads. There've been many near fatal accidents. I'm a runner, I'm a horseback rider. I had my hip replaced and I walk the roads and these construction trucks going up and down the streets are very uh, disrespectful of foot traffic and of animals. The amount of traffic has only escalated and increased. With the amount of development going on in Wells Branch right now, I have a five acre lot and I'm seeing hordes of wild animals coming into my back pastures that were never there before, feeling the push and the pressing of, you know, development and construction in the area. That's only happening because of the development that's going on. I don't think, <coughs> I think that the people who did work on these uh, amendments uh, to the cluster development that were mindful of the environment and of the residents involved, um, I support them. A lot of work went into that. It shouldn't be, policy shouldn't be dictated in our neighborhood by developers. It should be to support the environment. I have seven natural springs on my property and I'd like to keep the water pure, the air clean, and the noise levels down. Construction people in the area have often started before and after the uh, times for construction. And I have called the town before because of the noise, the violation to the noise ordinance. So please listen to the people that are here. We care about our community, community and we want to be team players and support thoughtful, empathetic, and mindful policy development. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Bob, if you want to ask, ask your question, Mike, now you can. Mike, um, in reading this, the 150 foot frontage, <laughs> that's, that says it's on a town street. So it'd have to be an accepted town road, not a private road in the development. Correct. In interior to the cluster subdivision, they can still go down to 50 feet. We usually don't see that unless it's around a cul-de-sac. Um, even on a cluster subdivision and on their interior road, even to meet the 20,000 square foot minimum that's that's required now, they usually end up with 100 or 125 feet of street frontage. Um, but the 150 foot that's in the ordinance would just be for town streets. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Is there anyone else from the public that wishes to address the board at this time? Hi, my name is Dave Cahill, 10 Coral Lane Wells. Also, I own Seacoast Land Acquisitions, which is part of uh, Home Innovations. Um, just a couple things. I mean, yeah, we do, as developers, you know, people are saying, you know, we just want to develop, develop, develop. Well, it's kind of funny, in this town, I mean, Mr. Hall, he's from uh, Wells, I'm from Wells. I've been here 63 years. Um, Chase is from Wells. You keep going down, Modi, 
So, I mean, we get a lot of people that we don't want to see wells go down the hill either, you know, but we're trying to develop to make homes affordable. When you start escalating costs, it's going to be a little prohibitive, right? <clears throat> excuse me, for everyone. And also, um, when we talk about vested land, um, we bought pieces of property prior to this year. Um, some of them are, I think we have like 900,000 into the property. And I think that we uh, had the sketch plan done. We're waiting now for a site walk. The town does not do site walks between, what, December to April or something, Michael? April 1st is the next. April 1st. So we've had our site, every plan that we could is basically in, and we're waiting for the site walk to change it. We have gone ahead and started engineering, but as you know, if we have to start changing things, it's just additional costs to developers. And there are a couple of those out there. Just wanted to like to be made aware of those. And that's about it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from the public that wishes to address the board? Hi. My name is uh, Tom McDevitt. I, I live on Branch Road. Um, just a couple quick comments because I know you guys have a, a challenge in front of you as far as vested. We learned about the, the, the project that's going to occur on Chick Crossing and have participated in any discussion with the um, planning board in this meeting. So, you know, to the gentleman's point, and I, I don't disagree with the developers as far as, you know, there is, we need to, there is going to be some development in Wells. You know, my, my family, we've only been here for four years, but we love it. Um, we picked the place that we, we lived, but that we live for a reason. It has some space. Um, you know, coming down that road on Branch Road and seeing the Spillers Farm and those open fields, that is really a draw to us. And, it, and I think it's a draw to others. So having that space of that rural is, is important. Back to the vested is that if just because somebody put in or the developers put in their paperwork that they would be vested or they other, other things. Well, as a resident, I also feel vested that to be part of this discussion that, you know, just because paperwork was put in, we should still should have a voice in this, whether they can move forward with the with the plans that they have. Um, and again, not trying to stop any and all development in wells. You know, people do need to 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 uh, to live here. Uh, we have no control over those price of lumber, the price of everything that's going up, but we do have some control over mm -hmm. the land that we have. You know, uh, keeping it a certain way. Um, and it's not just, you know, in, in some cases, we maybe we shouldn't build there. You know, a couple of years ago during the drought, we, we have a shallow dug well. You know, the property that we bought has been there since 1890. Um, and, you know, our well went dry. And for 45 days, we were, you know, relying on the generosity of our neighbors because it was too tough to try to get a driller to come in there. Uh, so for 45 days, we were hauling, you know, a hose from our neighbor driving down to the Kenny Bank, Kenny Bunk Wells water conservation, filling up buckets. Um, we have animals, uh, a few. Um, so that was our concern. My family's concern is also the effect of more people in that area. Um, as far as drawing from, they're going to have wells, you know, how many people, what's that effect going to be on the water? Um, and again, not trying to take, you know, money away from the, or business away from the developers, but trying to be smart about it. Um, so that is one of our concerns is how much more people in that area will, you know, take away the, the water. And you can say, well, drill a deeper well. Well, there's already been two wells that were drilled before we got there that went down to nothing. So there's no guarantee. As you know, you could spend fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 on just digging a hole in the ground and come up with nothing and then, you know, still have to pay the price. So anyways, it's also that is how many people are going to be in that area to, to take away you know, some of the resources that we need. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else that wishes to address the board at this time? Good evening. My name is Megan Walsh. I'm a resident of the town of Wells. Good to see everyone. 
I appreciate the opportunity to share our thoughts and concerns about uh, the development in Wells. I have actually been uh, participating in the Comprehensive Update Committee via uh, uh, Zoom. I was not able to attend because of health reasons. So I have been very active and interested in what's happening with the Comprehensive Planning Committee. Uh, and I think many people have been. I just want to make that really clear. The other piece is um, the Comprehensive Planning Committee has hired an outstanding firm, the Resiliency Planning and Design Group, who are producing a lot of very good and valuable scientific information that's been done by hydrologists, soil scientists. Specific to, to the water question in this uh, one discussion around the Branch Brook Aquifer, they um, state very clearly that it would be important for the town to reevaluate their setbacks. Um, and I understand the comprehensive plan is not done yet, but the science is current, real, and, and available to everyone. So I think that that's a really important piece to consider. Secondly, um, the visual impact of development is important, but what's more important to me than the visual impact is, is what's happening to uh, our infrastructure, our roads, the, uh, the land, and most importantly, the water. Wells relies on the Branch Brook Aquifer District for a, a, a large portion. I forgot what the percentage is, but a very large portion. And I think it's important to protect that land. Thank you all for your consideration. Thank you. Is there anyone else that wishes to address the board at this time? Seeing that, I'll take a motion to close the public hearing. Make a motion we close the public hearing. Second. All those in favor? Five nothing. Any discussion on uh, the proposed ordinances or any changes that would, the board would like to make to them? Did we want to have another discussion about this? Are we are so? Um, if we did, if we wanted to have another discussion, and we can put it on the agenda next uh, next meeting. You okay. have the meeting on the fifteenth, and then we also have the uh, April fifth meeting. <clears throat> so I, you do have if if you want to. Um, put this on the agenda for March 15th. We can have another that on the agenda for you to discuss further. And then it, um, if you, you would still have the April 5th meeting to put it onto the warrant. Okay. Okay. I, I, would, I would feel more comfortable if we talk, because one of the, one of the reasons that we began this and we thought about it was to screen it. That was the number one thing we wanted, we thought would be effective, um, because people were very upset about seeing all the, all the, um, houses and, side by side by side going down the roads and and I understand that part I also understand the ones that um, don't like the traffic but you know Wells has been around for 350 years it's changed every you know people come and it's a highly desirable area I want my grandchildren to live here and I'm sure you want yours too so to do that you have to build houses but um, I think other than um, the uh, the fact that we were just saving it for the um, the animals, we also look at affordability. Affordability is given to the developers if they have to pay or create a lot more infrastructure to be able to get a job done, and that has to get passed off. They're in the business, and I'm not saying they're only out there to build houses and nobody wants them. They're building houses that people want and that people want to live here. And um, so I think for us to look at it a little more closely, cluster development was a great idea. It provided a neighborhood and valuable land in a in a large uh, group together that animals could live in so i i think before we um discourage cluster developments we actually look one more time at what we're going to do i believe in the screening i think that's uh, personally i think that's a great idea um, i do believe that twenty thousand square feet on water and septic is tight that that you know, to put a well and a septic far enough away to keep it safe on um, property, that's a pretty tight thing to do. So maybe there's um, some kind of a, a compromise between 20000 and 40000 we can look at. But um, if not, then if everybody wants it to go forward, we, it will. But I think it deserves one more discussion. I, uh, I want to move it forward. I, I, we met with the planning board. We've talked about this. It hasn't been two meetings. We've had a few of them now. Um, Obviously, the number one thing that we hear constantly as elected officials in Wells is a uh, resounding issue with building. And uh, from one of the largest landowners in town, actually, I heard approval of the larger lot sizes. The, uh, the safety concern with the wells and the septic systems on a 20,000 square foot lot resound with me. Um, so I'm, I'm in favor of moving it forward in that way. I don't see a problem with letting the town vote on it. Um, I want to leave the vested interest in, though, just because there are people that have a lot of money tied up in this, and um, I think that's only fair 
to me, it seems like a good compromise because a good compromise is one in which nobody leaves happy. So that's, uh, to me, I've heard, you know, one side want to do away with something, the other side want to do away with something. I say leave it, send it out, and let the voters decide. Anyone else from the board? I mean, I don't have a problem putting it off for, for the next meeting. We got a lot of good information. Um, I, I'm concerned with this vesting is, issue. It, if, if people have put in plans, but they can't have sidewalks until after April 1st, and now it, it's all for naught, I, I, I don't think that's fair. Um, so I, I just think it needs a little more. I, I, I just would like to think about some of the things we heard tonight from both sides um, and, and have a a good discussion at the next meeting. Um, I'm I'm willing to put some stuff forward. I just want to I just want to make sure that we're doing it right. So, Mike, um, to that end, actually, that brings up a good point with the vesting and the site walks. You're starting again in April, but this is going on the June ballot. These projects, in particular, how many right now would this potentially affect, and would they have adequate time to get their site walks? Because the planning board, to my understanding, is starting to schedule those now. Yes. Yeah. As soon as the snow is gone in April first, date goes by, then the planning board can do sidewalks. We've already scheduled two for April 9th in lieu of the snow going away and, and being permitted to do it. Um, we probably have four or five different subdivisions that are waiting for that April date, either ones that have already submitted pre-apps or ones I know are going to be coming in soon. Um, but between the pre-app and sidewalk and the June town meeting date, that's, that's a good two-month period. Um, that's a fair amount of time to get in the preliminary application um, with all the materials needed. Uh, it doesn't mean it gets preliminary approval, just that they submit all the required materials. And that's all that's required for having a vested? Yes. Okay. Yep, just the preliminary application being submitted. I think one of the public comments was recommending uh, not being vested until preliminary approval, and that doesn't quite coincide with state statute. Um, it's always what is a... Uh, substantial review is the language that's in the law. And as I said earlier, the, the courts have decided either when an application is deemed complete or certainly at the first public hearing is when that threshold is met. Um, but the time period between April 9th and June 9th, I think is the town meeting, you know, that's a solid two months for someone to get a preliminary application in. Uh, should certainly be enough time there. Okay. Well, does that alleviate your concern that you... Up or yeah, um, but 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 we have it. Vet, we have it in the statute or, or the ordinance, and they vote on it in Jan, in June. It doesn't it go back to April first of twenty twenty two. Originally, we were looking at an April first date um, in the ordinance for just submitting a pre app um, as being vested. And I found that our current ordinance where that was contrary to our, our existing ordinance specifically calls out that a pre-app or sketch plan cannot be vested per the state statute. So that's why we had to look back and revise it and set it at some state of the preliminary review process. So Which gets read, rid of the yeah. April 1st date completely and puts us to whenever the voters approve the ordinance change. Okay, that makes sense yeah. to me. That's more serious. Anything from you? I see no harm in you know waiting until the fifteenth and learning more. I never see this. I, I'm always the type that wants to put things to the voters as much as I can, but I, I see no no harm in waiting until the fifteenth, and, and we'd only learn more uh, rather than right. that's. I mean, I, I think you might have some more people come and talk more about it. I, I you know. Well, let's be clear though. If it was another meeting, it would not be another public hearing. This is the public hearing. Okay. So there would not be a, another public hearing if no, we pushed off to another we'd, meeting. Right. We'd be hearing from people probably in our email, right? I mean, maybe that, more. That would be true. Off of what it was said tonight. I I just don't see the big deal with not, you know, with waiting the two weeks to, to vote on it. In my personal opinion, I, I don't see any new information that would be provided other than, than opinion of, of uh, residents, which is valuable. Mm -hmm. But I think that I've already heard over the month and a half that we've been discussing this in the three years since I've been on the board enough for me to make a decision tonight. But I think it sounds like it's three to two that would rather wait until the next meeting, so. Mm -hmm. So it um, sounds like there's potentially a, a motion that would be had to. I don't think it, it doesn't no need to be we no action on the item tonight. Right yeah. Yeah.
Okay, uh, so the public hearing is already closed, so we will move on to a public hearing on the 2022 Beach Parking Pass Policy. Yep. Like to tee this up first? Yep, so we presented this to uh, the board at the f um, February 15th meeting. Just the to highlights, um, the changes are really clearly articulating how, if you are a property owner in trust, LLC, or corporation, how you prove your residency status. Um, there is a change to the veterans sticker purchasability if you are the spouse of a veteran and that the vehicle is in your name as the spouse you're still eligible for that veteran sticker as a veteran household um and then the big change is really um changing the rate at the parking lot parking lots to five dollars an hour but instead of ch uh charging later into the evening parking stops being charged at six that's when dogs are allowed on the beach and that's when parking becomes free so folks that just like to go to the beach in the evenings to walk their dogs don't have to worry about payment to do so any comments <coughs> from the, the yeah, board on this or questions, questions. Sure, i'm always going to have questions on the beach parking sure. um i'm not a fan in in this it's written written uh that all beach lots closed at 11 are locked up by police and then the assumption would be that it wouldn't be open again until eight. The assumption, it doesn't work oh. that way, but we say this in our rules right here, and that's really not what we do. So in my mind, I'd like to strike that out because that's not what we do. Can you help me figure out Oper Section two, operational uh, hours? Yeah, it's on page three of the very top. All, all beach lots are closed at 11 or locked by the, up by the yeah. police department. Do you want that to be struck or do you want there to be additional language that makes it clear what time the beach lots are open? Well, here's, here's what been always my problem with that idea, right? So I, I have friends, people I know that might go down at 4 a.m. and like to sit and watch and wait for the sunrise or do whatever they do. I don't know what they do all the time. So I'm not crazy. But they like to sit there and, and, and go to the beat. You know, I just don't see. I think one of the reasons we put this in is more for that 11 to 1 thing where, where we had some issues with, with people doing, you know, you know. Uh, things at that time it wasn't ever that early morning and, th and there's guys there's lobstermen and there's people that want to go out in their boats at early in the morning in these in these lots especially the the uh eastern shore and, and there so I, that's why i just don't like the way that's written i, I don't okay I don't, so I don't how would it actually answer i, I first of all is there gates on every one of our lots i don't believe I believe it. Except there. for Gold Ribbon, I would say. Yeah. Yes, Gold, gold, gold Ribbon. Gold. And Casino and, Square. Right. And the harbor. Um, right. So you've got, um, right, the harbor is, is a, okay, so the, but that harbor is, so the lots that you would be buying a beach parking pass for, the harbor's not included. No, I know. But, um, so yes, people could that want to go watch the sunrise, they can go to the harbor. But how about this for language? All beach lots close at 11 p.m. and are locked up by the police, or, we don't need to put the word locked up, but locked by the police department. Um, gates reopen at what time? Okay, and I think that there's a balance here. When I receive a number of complaints from folks that live along Atlantic Ave about the people that show up at four, I tend to remind them that we are proud to be a working waterfront community, and we certainly do not in any way wish to um, limit access to folks that are earning their living on our waterways. So I think that we just need to be thoughtful, though, about... Um, uh, very few people are looking to party at 4 a.m., um, uh, start their party at 4 a.m. So I think that we really, um, we could have language that, you know, allowed for opening at 4 if if that's what you guys would like to well, do. I guess I, I would go, <coughs> why can't we make, and this will go over really not well with the Atlantic Ave people, which I understand uh, their, their complaint, but. I'm that, keeping my phone line now. I know, that, but that that particular parking lot is one that is going to be used by boat owners and people that want to fish off the jetty things that they you want to do on wells beach it somewhat at drake's island too with the jetty but they're not going boating off drake's island side so in my mind they're really the only two lots that are being affected and by locking it it's fine to lock the gross lot and the the playground lot uh, i don't even think there's a gate there though is there at the wells beach playground i can't imagine there's a gate there. mile road, mile road. No, do we is there a gate on the mile road lot there's no gate yeah, no. that, was, that was another question I had. You you mentioned gate. I didn't. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the beginning of yours. Um, closed or gated? I don't know if you, do you want to use the word gated or you just want to use closed. closed. So that uh, yeah, then we are saying like, like Gold Ribbon Drive, <coughs> um, my road lock is not a gate. Gold Ribbon Drive is not a gate. The only two and that one just has gross. gross as a gate. So I have a question. 
Chief Putnam, I think that there's language actually in our ordinance yes. that dictates like when you can be in lots. Is that correct? So we can just strike this language out of here yeah. and we can fall to the ordinance language if that would be making you more comfortable. What does the ordinance say? So just the no overnight parking. That closed. The gate is not closed. The word gate isn't used. Is there... Chief, is there hours in that ordinance, or is it just say that there's no overnight parking? There's no overnight parking. I don't think. I'm trying to think of it says. It says to 11. Six. Says, 11 I think it's 11 to 6 it? in the ordinance language. Because that's when people can start walking <clears throat> their dogs. <laughs> um, so I, I think that we went, we came up against this last summer. And um, the, the officers brought to it our, you know, my attention the ordinance language that's there. I believe that it does on our ordinance our lots are closed to folks accessing them between 11 and 6, and that's all lots. Well, we can't, I can't change the ordinance right this second, so, I, you know, there's nothing I, I mean, 6 a.m. certainly is reasonable. I mean, if people want to go down and go fishing, I mean, and sometimes they fish late, so 11 o'clock is, is, I think, a reasonable, and 6 a.m. is, so if that's what the ordinance says, then I, I would strike this out of the parking thing and let the ordinance control. I would also agree with just striking it. Right, just striking it out. And you guys can still pass this as amended yes. this evening. We don't need to bring it back if everyone's comfortable yep. with that. I think that's fine. Um, Any other changes before we open it up to public comments on this one? Uh, go ahead and open it to public. I can have Is anyone from the public right? wishing to speak on this item? You have to go sit out there. <laughs> Seeing none, I'll take a motion to close the public hearing. I make a motion to close the public hearing, and do you want me to continue to approve? Uh, yes, because then yes, we can still have. Right. Well, okay. uh, is there any other amendments, real quick, before we? Uh, we let's just close the public hearing. Okay, I close. I make a motion to close the public hearing. Just Second. Second. All those in favor? Five nothing. Mm -hmm. And then, okay, any amendments before we vote to either pass or reject? Uh, no. I'm good. I guess I'm good. I will take a motion. I'll make a motion that we approve the 2022 Beach Parking Pass policy as amended. Second. All those in favor? Five nothing. Thank you for the good work on that. Okay. Uh, next, we have a public hearing on release of funds for aerials. It's all Mr. Livingston. Thank you. Now, this is an expenditure as part of our ongoing efforts to keep our GIS mapping that's available on the town website um, up to date and, and more you know, have for people to use with updated aerials. The last aerials we had done were in 2016. Um, our plan was to update those aerials every five years. Um, it's been six years. And the aerials are provided through the state GIS office. Um, they have a contract statewide at a very good rate to provide aerials to all towns in the state of Maine. Uh, their contract expires this next year. So we'd be jumping in on the very tail end and they have to renegotiate a new contract with the provider for another five year you know, period. So I think it would be valuable for us to, to get this done now versus if we wait another year, prices are probably gonna go up, I assume. Any questions from the board for Mike before we open up to public comment? No. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Anyone from the public that wishes to address the board at this time regarding the aerials? Seeing none, I'll take a motion. I move to close the public hearing and approve the release of funds for aerial updates. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Five nothing. Thank you. Next up is public hearing on, on release of library beautification funds for painting the staff work area. Yep. So this so. is just money that's in reserve. It's a specific, it specifies it is a library beautification fund, um, and they just need some new paint in their staff area, and we need your permission <laughs> as a board to do it. Sounds fair. Anyone from the public <clears throat> that wishes to address the board at this time? Seeing none, I'll take motion. Do you want the amount in the in the motion? Yeah, that's great. Okay, I move to close the public hearing and approve release funds and re approve release funds from the library beautification fund for painting the staff work area in the amount of thirty one hundred dollars. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Five nothing. Thank you. Next is a public hearing on release of funds for rental of two ballot processing machines. Or okay. This is the same thing. We just need um, select board approval in order to access reserve account funds, and these are going to allow us to add two additional ballot processing machines above and beyond what we've had historically, really to accommodate our constantly increasing number of voters, which is awesome. It's a great problem yes, to have. Yes, it is a good problem. Anyone from the public? 
Seeing that, I'll take a motion. I move to close the public hearing and approve release of funds for rental of two ballot processing machines in the amount of $4,290. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none. Uh, all those in favor? I have nothing. Thank you. Next is uh, Tedisco Corporation doing business as the Bull and Claw Restaurant, 2270 Post Road Wells, application for a full time malt, wine, and spirits liquor license. This is a renewal. Anyone from the public? Seeing none, I'll take a motion. I move to close the public hearing and grant the license. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Five nothing. Thank you. Uh, next is. Um, Next is the town manager report. Thank you. Mr. Chair, if I may, we are at 6 o'clock. We have a very full agenda following. If the board is open to it, I would recommend we skip the town manager's report and we skip the first open to the public. You'll still have your final one at the end, but we try to get through your very meaty agenda in the next hour before your forum starts at 7. Do we have any ordinance language that requires no. to open to the public? And no. Okay. Is everyone on the board okay with yes. that? So we will still have an open to the public just at the end of the meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, moving on to current agenda items. The first being review and action on accounts payable and payroll warrants. Okay, you have a general warrant of $647,195.42 and a general assistance warrant of $1,774.03. Take a motion. I move to approve and sign the accounts payable warrant dated March 1st, 2022 in the amount of $6,000. $647,195.42 and the general assistant warrant dated March 1st, 2022 in the amount of $1,774.03. Second. All those in favor? Five nothing. Thank you. Next is update discussion and action on committees, projects, issues, purchases, and personnel. The first being discussion and possible action to schedule a public hearing on an easement for the sanitary district. Yes, so we have two people that are able to speak to this more adeptly than I can, and that is um, Nick Rico from our sanitary district, as well as Mike Livingston, our town planner. Um, and but basically, we need they need permission from us in order to get across our land, um, and we need to do this quickly so that we can anything to do with an easement must get to the town meeting for their approval because it's a land management action. So, do you want to come join us and explain what's going on? Sure. Thanks for letting me speak. Thank you. I'm from the sanitary district, and we have pipes under the harbor. Those pipes are have been there for 42 years operating. They continue to operate. One of them floated in 2018, and um, the Army Corps, Town of Wells, and the sanitary district, and especially the harbor master, don't want that to happen again. So we have to replace it. There is now something called a lease of submerged lands. And for me to get a lease, I need an easement to cross the town's land, both on the Drake's Island side and on the Atlantic Half parking lot side. And that's what I'm asking for tonight. Any questions about this? We don't currently have a lease, an easement. No. The only thing I have is a deed for the pump station itself. Uh, it's a small 60 by 100 um, plot of land. Yeah, that long driveway that leads to it is town-owned, and I'm surrounded by town-owned land. And there was never an easement done back in the 70s when the infrastructure was built. Uh, quite a bit of land has accreted since that time as yes. well. So. Yes. But um, I think this is pro forma. We're not going anywhere. Those pipes are still going to operate. Um, this is dotting our I's and crossing our T's. How close to carrying the project out are you now? The plan is this. We're going out to bed as soon as the public comment period on DEP's notice is up, which is a month from tomorrow, and uh, I've already bought the pipe. And uh, <laughs> and we did send a letter of support into I, DEP about the project. Thank you. Yes, and uh, and that was also recent skids for Army Corps of Engineers. They're the last permit we have to secure. Uh, it's the longest lead item to secure, and that should be in our hands hopefully this summer and after Columbus Day. I hope to start. Good. And I think there is a target date of March 31st to finish. Uh, so anything that's not done by then, I have to wait until the following fall. 
So what will happen is um, we need, because I, I, will, I think we're going to need to do the whole scheduling a public hearing thing and hosting the public hearing and then having it be on the um, your April 5th meeting. So if you're comfortable scheduling that public hearing this evening, we'll hold that public hearing next meeting on, April, on March 15th. Right? Okay. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anything Thank else you. important? All right, I'll All right. take a motion. I'm going to just schedule a public hearing on conveyance of easements to the Wells Sanitary District on March 15th at 6 p.m. and the Littlefield Meeting Room at 208 Stamford Road. Second. All those in favor? Thank you, Nick. Appreciate it. Thank you, and the trustees. Thank you, too. Thank you. All right. Next up is the fiscal year 21 audit presentation. So this is your annual um, presentation by our auditor um, to let you know how what great financial shape we are in. So Jody sent me um, the summary statements just in case folks wanted to look at them as they are being referenced. So that's what's on your screen, but your main event is right here at your table. Annual gold star. I love it. It is an annual gold star. It's true. <laughs> so I'm going to do you a solid. I'm going to make this quick because I know you guys got a long evening ahead of time here. Um, so again, I report every year. Really nothing has changed from prior last few years. Your, your finance staff is still the same talented individuals you have. Uh, you got con good controls in the finance department. Um, your fund balance is at a total of about 12.8. Uh, just under 11 million is unassigned. I believe that is up from last year, about a million. So, you know, your general fund keeps getting, you know, um, very healthy. Um, certain purposes for your general fund is to, you want to scroll down a little bit on that? Please? I sure do. And see, there's your fund balance right there of 12 in the general fund. And if you look to the right, you're seeing that your total equity in all of your funds, whether it's federal, local, reserves, is at 22 million. So for a town this size, you know, 22 million, you know, with the property valuation the way you are, the way your budget is, it's a good solid number. You know, you've got plenty of cash. You don't have to worry about short term borrowing. Um, you know, it's really nothing to say other than you're probably at least an A to a, a maybe even an A plus when it comes to finances. And like I said, my biggest thing is, is do you got a good software? You do. Do you got good people in place? You do. Do you got good controls in place? You do. You're obviously healthy. You've been healthy for years. Um, you keep go, you keep adding money to your CIP funds. You keep doing projects. You know, you got a brand new fire station. I'm sure you guys got more going on. Your library has been renovated in the last five years. You know, so you're spending money. You're making money. What else can I say then other than, you know, just keep going the same way you're going and I don't ever foresee an issue financially in the town of Wells. Awesome. I like to hear. Oh, Thank you to Jody in the finance department. Yeah, Jody. Any questions? I will say you did Mostly. give one management comment. And all that was was that transfer station deficit that you still have about 100k. This is its last year. Yep. Next year say, we won't even have that shadow off, over yeah. us. Yep. So, <laughs> and other than that, you would have had a nice clean management letter. So, like I said, everything's going great in your finance department and finances. So, no concerns on this end at all. Thank you very much. Very I appreciate well. your time. You. Yep. No problem. <clears throat> Next up is discussion and possible action on the 2022 beach management agreement. Yeah, so I included this in your packet. This, I believe, is just kind of something that you guys sign every three years and um, highly encourage you to do so, please, or and more importantly, give me permission to do so. Um, it is, we partner up, we make sure our plovers stay safe, um, and in exchange, we can um, get them nested safely and securely and off our beaches before the season really starts so that we don't have to continue the same level of intense monitoring through the busiest season that we have. So um, it's here and looking just for some support on getting it signed. Any questions? I will take a motion then. I move to accept the 2022 beach management agreement and grant the town management permission to sign the contract. Second. All those in favor? Five nothing. Thank you. Thank you. Next is discussion and possible action on Nautilus solar reduction of lease area. That is Mr. Livingston and Mrs. Chase. I apologize. I did not get that. Mrs. Chase would like a good map to show the reduction size in the area. I want to see what we're talking about. Sure. I emailed it to you earlier in the night. I don't know if... Well, let's pull it up, shall we? Yes. <laughs> Hold on. That we can do. We have the technology. And, and while you're working on that, if I yep, give please. a little background, uh, Nautilus Solar is the entity that's currently leasing 
the town property off Curtiford Road uh, for an under construction uh, solar field. Wow, you got to it fast. I'm very quick on the draw. <laughs> <laughs> and back in November, they proposed a reduction in the lease area. Currently, their lease encompasses four different town properties and a, and a much larger acreage than they needed to do the solar project. The lease has a three-year development period where the solar company gets approvals, um, starts construction, finishes construction, and at the end of construction, the lease contemplates a reduction in lease area uh, based on as-built conditions. For finance purposes, they would like to reduce the lease now versus later. Uh, they're under construction, but it has been completed. They proposed back in November to reduce the lease area to the limits of their proposed fence line, which was roughly around their actual solar panel location. Um, but to get the proper solar uh, capacity of the solar arrays, they cleared trees above and beyond the fence line. Uh, so you can see on that map um, some of the, the hatched area. Um, the original proposal in November consisted of a lease reduction lease area of about 41 yeah. acres, right in the middle which there, right? was this dashed line. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Board of Selectmen declined their request to reduce the lease area to that based on the fact that they had cleared much beyond the fence area. Right. And they still had an easement right for solar capacity above and beyond the area. So the revised map they've given us goes around this perimeter, which is right to the edge of this, this dotted area. Um, and the new total area is a little more than 54 acres. Um, so there was about a 14 acre discrepancy or a question that was raised and now they've revised their plan to, to go right to their tree line. Can you succinctly sh share with the board what you shared with me this morning as far as um, meeting all of our demands? Oh uh, yes, yes and that was you know the, as the board you know said at previous meetings that they uh, you denied or declined their previous request and and they came back with a plan that that met the comments and, and requests and conditions we put forward. So what they cleared is what they're leasing? <coughs> yes, exactly. Okay. Yep. And I did take the map they proposed, compared it to new, new Google imagery, and it matches very closely. It's a tree line, so it's always plus or minus, you know, a few feet. Um, but nope, the, I reviewed the plan, reviewed the Google imagery, reviewed their deed descriptions, um, and the documents provided. Um, there were three different documents that were provided. Leah, the town attorney, has reviewed them as well. Um, I think she's here tonight. She, sure she is. has additional comments on those. But the actual lease area, you know, it has has been properly changed to the total area, and it does make a significant difference. The lease agreement is for six hundred fifty dollars per acre per year, and the difference between forty acres and fifty four acres was nine thousand dollars. So. So do we now have use of that that land that is being reduced? It is time? beyond the fence line. Um, they have the right to continue to clear that area. So their lease is a 30-year lease. So if trees start growing back up within their new lease areas, they have the right to go in and cut them. Oh, uh, yeah. But the public could still walk through that area too. But they uh, they can't go beyond that. No, that is the that would be the new limits of the lease area. They couldn't cut beyond what's cut now. So beyond that, they own property beyond that, though, right? Oh, we own that it. we own it, right? So we can use that land if we want to. So the yeah. hatch, correct? The hatch lines are the area that we would then be able to use in addition to the land surrounding that's also owned by us. Is that what you're saying? Yes, our, our property keeps on going to the heath. Right. Yeah. So we have this strip of, of non-swamp because mm -hmm. the heath is all very swampy. Yeah. Uh, but we have a strip of land all the way through this area, and we have this parcel. And then all the parcel falls off. But Mike, I think the question is, um, can you put the can you put your finger on the line of where the new reduced lease area line is? It's not the inner line; it's that <coughs> one. This was the old proposal. And this okay, that's showing the new one. Gotcha. Okay. okay, that's why <coughs> this was the yeah. extension to what right. they had already that's done. Right. That's why I understood. This, yeah. Which is why we. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I understand now. Yeah. Any other questions or comments from the board? I will take a motion then. I'll make a motion that we accept the action on the Nautilus solar reduction of lease area. Second. All those in favor? Oh, so oh, please, sorry. And can you please give the town manager approval to sign the documents? And 
give the town manager approval to sign the document. Thank you so much. Second. Second as amended. Okay. All those in favor? Five nothing. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Uh, next up is discussion of new rule governing ARPA funds. Yes, so I've made you a quick little presentation for us to walk through together to talk about this. And it's not presenting. There we go. All right, so here's what has happened. We are getting $1,127,449, and that should be super, super exciting. Um, and it is, but it comes with some challenges, as all things can. So... Um, when we met about this months ago, I brought forward to you and we were working um, on ideas based on what had been the interim rule that the federal government had released to us. And you as a board, because that interim rule only allowed that money to be used for four choices of, um, of infrastructure. We could expand broadband. We could do subsurface stormwater analysis and systems. We could improve and expand public water supply lines. And we could improve and expand public sanitary systems because we didn't qualify for um, using the money to reimburse ourselves for COVID losses because we didn't have any, okay? So that was what you guys decided to do in the past, okay? And we said, okay, then we're gonna partner up with KK and W and we're gonna partner up with Well Sanitary District and we're going to use the money in that way. Well, now the federal government has said, you know what, actually, we don't care if you had any revenue lost or not. We're going to assume that you did. So before, when the federal government was, in order to prove revenue loss, there was a four-step formula that you had to, to use to calculate your revenue loss. We would not have qualified. The final rule, they've just said, look, you can either do the calculation we gave you before, if you're going to have more than $10 million in losses from that calculation, or we're just going to assume that everybody had at least $10 million of loss, and therefore, you can just tell us that you've had up to the total amount of money you're receiving from us as COVID loss. And um, as long as it doesn't exceed $10 million, we're all good. Okay, so that's where we are right now. And what they've told us is that an eligible expense to be used for this money is any governmental service. And so the, the short end of that is that the change means that because we can claim that full $1.127 million as revenue loss, we can spend it however you want. So um, some examples. We can use it for road building and maintenance and other infrastructure. General government administration, staff costs, and costs related to administrative facilities. Environmental remediation, premium pay for essential workers, provision of police, fire, and other public safety services, including the purchase of trucks and vehicles, and projects that will benefit residents. That's the, that's the federal language, just so you know I'm not being vague there. Um, so this is what you guys really, in, in, and this again, my job is to kind of propose to you things that I think you guys might want to talk about. Your job is to tell me what you want me to do. We can either continue to go down the path that you had discussed last spring, and we focus on KK and W and well sanitary district projects, and we just use the money in that way. We can register the revenue loss claim, and we can use the funds on governmental services of your choosing, whatever that might be, or that we could approach this from a hybrid kind of perspective. You know, continue to use the money for um, improvement to sanitary district substations, for instance, okay? But then also, use the rest of the money to pay for some infrastructure projects that we know are coming at us, like the Drake's Island Bridge, Web Hannett North, and Casino Square Seawalls, that even if this board puts forward to the voters and they approve the largest bond package that I've put in the budget, we still don't have funding for, okay? So just looking tonight to bring this back to you guys, to say here, guys, this, this money is here. We've got to, we have to commit to how we are spending it by December of 24. So we've got some time but we have projects that really could possibly use this money sooner rather than later, okay? Whether they're pump stations at the sanitary district, whether they're um, infrastructure projects that are specific to the town of Wells. And I really, you guys are the ones that need to decide how you wanna focus this. Okay, so okay. thank you for presenting this. Um, I personally believe that it would be prudent of us to continue to work on the pump stations, but as a hybrid um, also, set aside money for these projects, which are critical infrastructure. Um, you know, and, and I don't know what the, dollar amount breakup would be for that, but I, I think it would be a very smart idea to do that. I, I totally agree with that. I mean, we have the Drake's Island Bridge, Web Hannet yeah. North, the Casino Square. I it's mean, these money. are big money, and we don't, and we're don't. we trying to get the other big monies that have more priority right now, and so I think looking at that, and as well as helping with the um, sanitary district, and the, yeah, okay. I think that. I like the hybrid model. I think mm -hmm. do a 50-50 split. 
some stations. I mean, the, the sewer district's a quasi-municipal organization, but that infrastructure still serves the town of Wells and helps us environmentally. And they have a lot of costs coming up too, and they're much smaller residents. than us. So. I, it, does everyone feel comfortable with kind of a 50-50 split? Because I can come back to you with, um, I can work with um, Nick and we and figure out what does that look like for him, come back with the projects that he would use that $550,000, $560,000 on. And then, um, and then the other five hundred and sixty dollars would just simply go into the infrastructure reserve account to be used for um, those projects as they come up. Do you want me to come back at the next meeting showing what that would look like? So, I would like that. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh no, I was just going to say. So if we had, if we had that money here, and there were some grants that came up really quickly, we would be able to get that those that matching because you always have to have cash to be able to get those. That would be something that we could look at quick Absolutely. more quickly than okay, perfect. Yes, I, I think I like the idea of at least because I have no idea. I I've heard estimates on seawalls and stuff. I, I actually have no idea what a, these pumps take. What how much is going to cost? I want to hear what comes the, to Yeah, I'd like to see um, a yeah. proposal of a 50 split, and 50, then um, I'd like to see a percentage split based on the total cost of the projects. So, like an equal amount going to each of the projects based on the total cost. It's just as an example that the line that they're going to be boring across, um, boring across the harbors over a million dollars to do that project. And then some of the pumps that they have are forty, fifty thousand dollars a piece that need to be replaced. So. So I understand what you're asking for, Sean. My concern is that I, in, because I've had you know extensive conversations with um, Sanitary District about this already when we were kind of building up that framework for the spring, they could spend all of this and still need six or seven more million dollars. <coughs> so I, I am happy to kind of show as a percentage, but there isn't a cap. Does that make sense from the Sanitary saying. District? Tough to estimate. Yeah. That yeah, then I, let's just see the numbers for a 50-50 split then. And, 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 and go, go from, from there. there. That's at least a, a base yeah, discussion. I agree. You know. Okay. Did they not qualify for ARP funds? Um, I don't believe that they – I haven't heard him say that they have ARPA funds coming at them, but I'll confirm with him if they have anything coming towards them. I mean, they, they, they also have in, in the, the federal infrastructure. Yes. There was been, they, they got a lot of money out there for water and sewer district so they, they they may have access to other funds that we won't have and I, I would agree our infrastructure funds are going to come from my taxpayers so the more we can offset those the better off we'll be and if they can get some infrastructure funds I mean we're talking four or five billion dollars coming to Maine for infrastructure from this you know I think those are funds that those folks can look at and we won't be able to get. Okay. So can we? I guess should ask this tonight while you're still here. But can we have a Nick at the next meeting when we go yes. to discussers, just so way we can yeah. Yeah, uh, hear details from him if he's able. Yeah. And he and I have a meeting scheduled for this coming week, so um, we'll have time to kind of hash out some details and, and really be prepped to present on the March fifteenth meeting. Okay. Good. Okay. Any other questions? Sounds like a good plan to me. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, next is discussion and possible action to award the executive human resources contract. Marissa. Yeah, so um, I worked with the personnel advisory committee to draft an RFP that we put out for executive level um, human resources services. We sent it directly to a number of Maine and New Hampshire firms, and we also posted it out, of course, online. Um, we only received three responses back. I did have some queries, um, a couple of them, interestingly, from international companies wondering if we would be interested in services that were provided from Canada, China, and India, but never on site. And I did respond on our behalf that that would not work well for us. We needed that to be more in person. So, um, we had three responses. One of them was from an Arizona firm. Um, they were the most expensive as, um, as well as being fully remote and not able to provide us with a person that was on site as needed. Um, the second one was from a firm in Portland. They were 50% um, higher than the recommendation that I have for your board, which is to award the contract to HR Main Consulting at $90 per hour. That is the firm that we have been using um, as well as the firm that the town has been working with in the past. And um, they just are the most cost effective as well as we know for a fact that we can work well with them. I like the continuity and the fact that yes. they're the cheapest option makes it an easier decision in my mind. Do you need authorization to also sign a contract? I sure do. Okay. Is there any questions for Lewis on this? Sounds like a good approach. And this will be a three-year contract with an option to renew. Just if, uh, just so you um, 
that's what I am looking for permission to sign. If you're uncomfortable with that, then please let me know what level of contract you are comfortable with me signing. Are there any provisions in there that if if it's not working out and we decide to go a different route, that we can end the contract? Absolutely. Yeah. That makes me feel yes. better. Because I think I, I think we should review it periodically to make sure it's meeting I would agree. our needs. And if it's not, and the, our employees' needs especially, right. then I think we need to have an op, uh, an opt out provision. Uh, agreed. And actually, if you'll remember, this board <coughs> in voting to go in this direction, we made an agreement that we would check in with our employees a year from that date right. to just really see how is this system working. Um, we have hired our full time HR generalist, and what I've heard for so far for feedback from staff is that she's great which is wonderful to hear, um, and looking forward to... Is she going to come to a meeting at some point? We would love to have her come to a meeting. Yeah, sounds great. So... I thought we had set a sooner time frame. I thought we said six months and a year. Okay. We expect you're right, John. Yeah, I think I remember yep. the same. Okay. So um, the six-month mark is actually coming up fairly soonish. Okay, so um, if we want to do six months from the time of your vote, um, that will give us about three months from now, and that will, which should be, to be more, yeah. I think that I would want us to be, I'm hoping that we're going to get really great feedback. If we're not, I would hope that we would be able to have op the option of using that next six months to remedy based on the feedback that we're getting, um, since three months is not, is, well, hopefully enough time to just have everybody, things working well, and I'm not hearing that things aren't, um, but just want to make sure that we're giving the opportunity to work. Okay. But we can work on a, um, I'll work with the Personnel Advisory Committee to draft up how to survey staff for the review of the system and then run that, that um, what, what we work on together through this board to get your approval before releasing that at the six month point, if that works for you guys. Any other questions from the board or ready to make a, yeah. take a motion? I move to award the Executive Human Resources contract to HR Main Consulting and give the town manager permission to sign the contract. Second. All those in favor? Five nothing, thank you. Uh, next is discussion and possible action to schedule a public hearing on charter changes. Yeah, so I've got two proposed charter changes for you. Um, wrote you a memo in your packet. The first is to allow the select board to carry forward monies from one fiscal year to the next. It's a practice that this town had been doing for a goodly number of years. This is the first year that we have not because um, oh, Leah's not sitting here any longer. I'd point to her. Um, Leah pointed out to me that that has never been allowed actually by your charter. Your charter actually has very clear language that prohibits that practice. So um, I said, great, then we will stop doing that. Um, but brought, she wrote us up some language. Um, you'll see section 7.12 of the charter entitled lapse of appropriations. So right now, um, this would, um, right now, what your charter says is, except as otherwise provided in this charter or by law, every appropriation after review by the Board of Selectmen may lapse at the close of the fiscal year into the undesignated fund balance to the extent that it has not been expended or encumbered. So that's what's supposed to be happening now. If we have budgeted for, you know, $50,000 of ping pongs um, and we don't buy those $50,000 of ping pongs, we don't have permission to then carry that forward money that 50000 into the next year to secure those ping pongs that year, it goes into the undesignated fund balance. And that's why that fund balance is, is rising as it, as it has been. So this would allow, the redlined language here says, prior to the end of the fiscal year, the Board of Selectmen may determine to carry forward to the next fiscal year and assign the fund balance accordingly, any appropriated but unexpended funds available at the end of the fiscal year for non-capital expenditures, provided that the funds are used for the same purpose as originally appropriated. And sometimes um, things happen. Like last year, we had um, ordered ammunition. And we had ordered it, but we hadn't paid for it yet. And the ammo got caught up because of supply chain issues, okay? And so that money wasn't able to carry forward to purchase what had been approved by the time that the ammo finally got to us. So it, this just, everything would have to go through the board. It is not a town manager or, or department head action. It has to go through the board as, just as you have done in the past. You know, the, the proposal has to be brought to you, an explanation has to be provided, and you're, this would allow you to only allow specific funds at specific dollar amounts for specific reasons to carry forward into the next year. So that's the first proposal. The second one is to shift the town from a, um, an elected town clerk to an appointed town clerk. So currently what happens is um, every three years, the town votes to elect a town clerk, and then that town clerk appoints 
they're deputy town clerk and assistant town clerk. Those are not positions that are um, hired by the town. I think it's really important to hear this proposed change is not in any way a, um, a, a judgment or a statement about the quality of our clerks. We have been extremely fortunate in this town. We have had professional, competent, dedicated public servants in our town clerk's office, not just presently, but also in the past. Everyone, however, has a right to live their own life at some point and um, choose to retire from service or to shift. And we may not be so fortunate moving forward as to have um, experienced people uh, um, applying or running for our, our clerk position. And remind, or just a reminder, then appointing the additional other staff in our, in our clerk's office. So we really do run the risk if we don't have an existing clerk that runs for that office. We run the risk of not only having an inexperienced person come in as the clerk, but they also then can remove all of our experienced help in that office. It's just a dangerous place to be. So this, um, this proposal is very simply eliminating the words town clerk and the from your list of uh, nominations, elections, and town meetings elected officials in your charter. And so what would happen is if the select board votes to move this forward to the town meeting warrant and it passes, we have an elected clerk right now whose term goes through June of 2023. She would continue to serve in that capacity as would her appointed, that she has appointed, her deputy and her assistant. I am committed to um, if this passes, this would become a position that would be then under the, um, the hiring and um, supervision of the town manager. Okay? So my commitment publicly, and I want you to hear too as you're making your decision, this position should be offered first to our existing clerk. Should she say, no, thank you, I'd really like to retire now, or whatever else she wants to do with her life, um, then it will be offered to our deputy clerk. We have good clerks and great institutional knowledge. Um, and then, depending on how those answers come back to us, then and only then, if they choose to um, create open spaces within their office, only then would we go and, and um, into the labor market to be hiring folks in. But none of that would happen until June of 2023 because the clerk's elected position would remain in effect until June of 2023. And then this new language would um, trigger that becoming an appointment, not, a hire, uh, not an election. Can we also have language that would say in case of any vacancy before that point that this is what would happen as well? Oh, Leah says no. No. My gut reaction to that is that the term is the term and the charter speaks to what happens with elected officials for their unexpired terms. So I would not, I would not recommend doing that. Okay. I mean, that would be like a very rare circumstance, but I just want to make sure we were yeah, covered I everywhere. It should, it, I think it should go through the end of the term and then whatever the vacancy provisions are in the charter, you could fill it that way. Okay. Yeah. I, uh, I, I don't have a problem with the first, um, the first recommendation, but I'm, I'm leery of the second, um, I guess I'm concerned about removing uh, right now something that's dictated by the voters placing it under the town manager's position. And it's no reflection of you, but again, contemplating a situation where maybe we had a town manager who was a little self-serving or something, what's to stop them from appropriating a clerk? I mean, I guess that instance is true for any employee, but a clerk that wouldn't suit, I mean, voting is a, a particularly sensitive thing nowadays. I really like that being under the control of the voters. Not, we haven't had a problem traditionally in Wells, so I just... I'm concerned about that, I guess. I understand what you're saying, but. At one point, uh, one point um, for years, um, the assessing position was elected. And, um, and we have right now a $3 billion valuation here. So uh, you had to be 18 and uh, electable. And you would have been the assessor for, you know, you would have to have some qualifications. You have to pass a certification and stuff like that. But still, um, we had reached a point back in the 90s, around 1990 or in the early 90s, where we looked at it and said, you know, hey, I was the assessor. I was elected. And, um, and that's just not a good thing. What if, you know, you really should have qualified people do it. And I think, um, and we did, and it worked out well. Yes, I was offered the job. I had applied for it, and I got it. But um, but it, it really was the right thing to do. It made sense. It was it was um, safe for the town. It meant that there had to be some kind of um, um, experience and 
and uh, education before somebody took over that. And I think the town clerk probably at this point it has reached that same level of, of time and everything. It's nice to have a tradition, but I think um, it would be imp it, that the town clerk takes care of a lot of things and again appoints other people. So I, I think this is the time that maybe we look at hiring it and looking at people that are educated in that. And um, certainly we have the experience right now down there and it's great. We're very, we've been very lucky about that. Um, but again, in the future that we might not be. And I think it's for the safety of the town and the, and the, and the benefit of the residents to have it in an appointed position where people had to apply and there'd be a process where you elect the best person for the job. I agree with Kathy. I think the timing's correct on this. And I, I, I agree with John that it's a very important position in terms of the integrity of the election. I think to allow it to remain an elected position could possibly deteriorate the integrity of that if, if there were future candidates that managed to get elected that did not, you know, Hold themselves to the same standards that our current clerks do. So that would be my concern, um, which is why I'm going to support um, that charter change. Has this been discussed with the current folks down there? Yes, at length. Because I, I was on this board a couple of times when this this proposal came up, yeah. and it was soundly defeated both yeah. times. Um, <clears throat> and I'm really leery of going down that path again um, because the, the town clerk position is a sacred one and people feel it's their position. So um, I think we can have the public hearing. I'm, I'm not sold on it yet, but okay. we can have the public hearing. But it really is important to me to know that this is something that they support, um, truly support, because if they don't, it'll get soundly defeated again. I hear that. I, I really think that you know, the important thing that I think is different <coughs> in this proposal is making it very clear to the voters from day one, this is not a referendum right. on our clerks. Mm -hmm. This is a referendum on, um, and I guess the, the, I hadn't looked at it the way that you were looking at it, John, I was looking at it exactly in the opposite direction because voting is such a core function of those clerks wanting to make sure that that is never in jeopardy by having somebody who is not really able to run an election, be in, in charge of the elections for the town of Wells. And um, our clerks have served us for years and they really, they may well choose in the next few years to, to do something else with their, with their, their lives. And so um, the concern I have is losing all of that in <coughs> institutional knowledge in one blow. That really alarms me, but um, I think a public hearing, of course, that would that would need to be part of it. Um, I have, though, this is not coming as a surprise to the clerks. I've been in conversations with this about them about this with them for at least a year, um, and I will not speak for them as to how they feel about the proposal. But it certainly has not been done without their um, dis without discussions with them. I would also like to say that um, I really appreciate the fact that we're recognizing their experience and stuff, and that we're allowing them the. the you know, to be able yes. to remain that. I mean, that is everything. That I don't think that might have been in the cards the last time, but but this time it does. And with the, they can train or do whatever to to look at um, the future. And I think as long as they're comfortable with it, I'm happy to because I think it's time to do this. Yeah, I would never support it. If it no, wasn't I wouldn't support it if it wasn't first because it just wouldn't be fair right. or in right. the spirit of what we're trying to do here. Anything from you? Yeah, I've always wondered what. I mean, is do, when you when this I, I've never quite understood this process of the town clerk. I know other towns don't have it; some do. Um, but couldn't could anyone apply? You know, go in and get voted in as town clerk. Yes. I mean, I, mean, I, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know what I was yeah. doing, and that, that's always been my fear. Somebody sees, oh, seventy thousand dollars. I'll go do that. You know, what I mean, as a, you know, um, and try it out and see and. And most of the time, we have we have such high quality in our town clerk office. That's not going to happen because you know people know that they, these people are good people in their town of Wells. You know, they're 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 people people know and they vote that town clerk in. But as we get older, all of us and and things go, is that going to be the case? Do we have that person that that can step in in the end and that we can get elected and and be good, or do we have someone that's no experience, has no idea what's going on, but just saw that? The price tag on said that oh, this sounds good and I'm going to try it and see what happens and you know I, I just don't know that's that's my one of my fears with this position is how that that would work if you know we've been lucky in Wells 
the elected position has been been someone that's been trained and kind of moved along, that might not be the case forever. And so it, it's something we can look at. Uh, you know, you have a public hearing, we can have a discussion on it. We can see what the plus and minuses are and, and move from there. That's my opinion. Could we also get just like a memo or a letter from the um, town clerk's office that would Absolutely. show support yes. for it? I think that would they go along the public hearing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That would be nice though before that. Yeah, I mean, I, I yeah. think it would only help. So, could could we also could we also? I, I'd love to see at the hearing what how many towns have elected town clerks and how many towns have at least around us. I don't want you to go to state of Maine, but I'm thinking very few, very few now. I, I think it, the. The trend is certainly away yeah. from elected towards appointed for all the reasons that have been articulated here. I'm not sure. MMA might have a list of that. I'm not sure if there is a, a repository for that information. But I can just tell you in my experience, definitely um, far less elected clerks. And just in the towns that I have represented, that issue has come up and it's been asked and there has been transition away from um, elected town clerks. I know we're on limited time. Let me just pose this question. Let, let's say there was a, a clerk that was appointed that was causing a lot of problems and the community had an outcry and the town manager refused for whatever reason to fire that individual or get rid of them. What what would the town have? To Great question. It? So um, you would terminate your town manager. I mean, that that's the answer. I mean, if your town manager is, is abusing their authority and have first off has hired a bad hire and doesn't do their job in their two month review, four month review, six month review to identify the challenges, give opportunity for correction. And if there isn't to dismiss them from their position, you have a, a, a you as the board, I am your employee. And if I'm not doing my job, you call me to task for it. And if I actually decide to take a stand and say, I am not disciplining an employee who is clearly damaging the town, then you fire me and you do so with cause at that point. So it doesn't even cost you any money. So, you know, like it just, you know, that, that you guys have, ch there are checks and balances written into your charter, okay? I, I don't, I actually, I, the other day I learned that I have the authority to waive fees at the pavilion down at the harbor, and I think that that is probably the only true authority I have in this town, okay? So, um, I, yes, this would make it so that myself as the town manager or whoever you have as the town manager in your future years will have the authority to hire the town clerk the deputy town clerk, the assistant town clerk, but in the same way that if um, if I had a rogue finance, Jody, may I pick on you? If I had a rogue finance director that couldn't get the books in order, and every you know we've got an auditor coming in being like, "You guys are a mess down there," and I don't fix it, you fire me. And that same thing is true with the town clerk. Yeah, and like, I think yeah. ultimately we're held responsible to the taxpayer, yeah. so that's why I don't have an issue with it because yeah. there's still recourse. I think the other thing that's interesting about your charter, and, and if for some reason the, this board were to decide you did not want to move forward with this going to the people, um, I, Leah, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that what, one of the unique things about Wells is that you have an elected town clerk, but your recall provision does not allow for recall of the clerk. So we are. I'm not sure about that. I'll, I'll look while you're talking. I, talk I think. Yourself. I think when up. Lee and I talked about this the first time, I think that that is in the list of officials that can be recalled. I don't think the clerk is one of them. But um, so I just I would think that if you don't wish to put this one forward, if I'm correct about that, I would encourage you to maybe change that portion of your language so that you're not caught in a place where you have um, kind of I think it was Franklin County four or five years ago. Some kid got elected as the county treasurer and just never showed up for work. Um, and there was no recall provision. And so they had to keep paying him. For the, the you know, the th so there, there are some dangers um, to be had. Okay, so I'll let's take a motion. Okay, um, the, um, these are the way it looks, it's almost like you have you having two separate public hearings yes, set up. Yes, okay, yes. so, um, okay, so I make a motion that we schedule a public hearing on the proposal for moving funds forward. Is that okay? Okay. Yeah. Um, on March 15th, do you want it on that day? March 15th at um, 6 p.m. and in the Littlefield room at 208 Sanford Road. Second. All those in favor? Five nothing. And then the second. Okay. The second one would be I would make a motion to have a public hearing to consider an ordinance entitled um, uh, to. Uh, 
convert the position of the town clerk from an elected to an appointed position. And, um, and that would be for March 15th at 6 p.m. in the Littlefield Room at 208 Sanford Road. Second. All those in favor? Five nothing. Thank you. Okay. Next up is discussion and possible action on tax payments. Uh, nope, we skipped one, Mr. Chair. Discussion. H. Discussion. Oh, I have H as tax payments. That's what it is, tax payments. H is tax abatement. I'm so sorry. Do you not have H as discussion yes, and possible action to schedule a public hearing on a conveyance of a portion of town land on map and lot 34? No. No. Sorry. No. Okay. Is should, that a critical one or should it? It kind of is. There? Okay. I will say, Larissa, that that was posted on the town's agenda on the website to the okay. extent that that, I think that's important that, you know. So H, is, as I've read it, was posted or H as they have it was posted? I saw that bit that you talked about. I don't know if it, was, if it was H or not, but it was that was posted. I'm, I'm just saying if it wasn't a posted agenda item, then this you don't want to talk about it. must be in regards to the Robinson it or whatever sure is. It is. That was posted. Okay. Yeah. So it's H in the background notes, too. Okay. I'm sorry, guys. I apologize. Um, I sent you the wrong final agenda. Okay, because I don't have any of that. So this is what I posted okay. to the website. And, um, Can you see it? Or? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm hoping this is what was posted to the website. Leah saw it, so let's cross our fingers. Cindy, I didn't see it, but somebody, a taxpayer, it? brought it up, and they were not happy. Um, maybe we can get there. Maybe we can't. Yeah, it's on the agenda. Do you have the aversion in your in your system? The new version. Um, I have it on my. I downloaded it this morning. Um, but I need yeah. some. Okay. Yeah. 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 Thank you. It's there. It's not on ours. Okay. Right. We can see it here. Discussion and possible action to schedule a public hearing on a conveyance of a portion of town land on lot and lot 34-5E in exchange for an easement over a section of private property at map and lot 34-5 on Ridgetop Lane. Is this a mic discussion? Nope, this is a me discussion and Carol as needed. Okay. Yeah, okay. so this is, so we, um, if you guys are open to having this on discussion. Um, How does everyone feel? Yeah. I guess we should be able to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, the the Ridgetop Robinson Pine Ledge project you all are familiar with. It's been 20 years, apparently, um, in discussion. We have the engineering done. We're ready to go. There's a, a, a catch basin on the, on the edge of the road that's on town-owned land. Mm -hmm. The water will funnel from the Pine Ledge and Robinson Road, side of the road, Coming down, come and join us, Carol, at the table. Um, go under the road, into this catch basin on the ridge top lane portion of the road, side of the road. The, then there's a drainage pipe that is designed to go from that catch basin underground all the way down that length of that road to a personal private property on the other side of the road um, and drain there. We have all of the easements to make that happen, save one. The landowner's concern is that they abut where the catch basin is. Retention pond. Thank you. Thank you. That's why we have a good engineer here. <laughs> and, um, it's actually got a fancier term than that now, but I think we all know what a retention pond is. And imagine that. And that's really what it is. It's where the old, remember the old garage that was demolished? Mm -hmm. yeah. And then you folks luckily gave us the authority to buy that land and put the retention pond there. So we bring not all of the water, because some of the water from the end of Pine Ledge does go out through the easement into the woods. But the majority, we couldn't drain it, it's so flat. Majority of that water comes across the street to that retention basin, for lack of a better word. It sits there, and, and the basin, and, and Larissa was very close, the basin will retain that water. It will infiltrate it after it's treated into the ground. However, when we started running the new updated 100-year flood data, there was a possibility that that retention basin could be overtopped. So being engineers, and we always put a factor of safety into things, we said, 
let's put kind of an overflow pipe coming out of that retention pond that would come out of the pond, go all the way down Ridgetop Lane to an existing pond, and probably will never see water except for a small trickle, but is there if, in fact, our storm intensities continue to go forward and, and be higher and longer lasting. Um, the property owner's concern was his side yard is where that retention basin would be. So this is the this is the t old town garage mm -hmm. building was here. It does not exist any longer. The retention pond. This is an eyesight test. <laughs> would be there. I do have and then these. The property like line them. for this gentleman is right here. Yeah. And so his concern is that if that um, Two things. One, if it overflows, he has a pond behind his house that overlaps with our property line. Okay. So his concern is that if that overflows, it's going to overflow his pond, which will then overflow his property and into his basement. Okay. And he has installed a lot of infrastructure on his property. Great to perimeter, perimeter drains. drains yeah. Great perimeter drains. So his request. And he's also concerned that even though he fully trusts Carol and I, which yes. is lovely, <laughs> he nice, does. He likes um, us. you know, that both of us might not live forever and may not hold our positions forever. And that future towns, either town meetings or select boards or so forth, might choose to expand that or choose to build something further behind it. And so what he said is, I'm not granting you an easement. In, and we need it because we need that pipe to come right through his property there. Um, and he also owns the other side of the road because we also looked at moving it just across the road and not needing an easement from him. But nope, we would need it either way. Um, is, look, you give me a buffer of land so that I have some assurance that, A, if there's spillover, I've got a way to protect myself from it. And you can't build on this part, making it even more likely that I will have flooding issues. And in exchange for that grant of that land, I'll give you the easement you need. And the, the amount of property that we're talking about for the buffer is just under a quarter of an acre. It has no value to anyone but the town of Wells or to this other abutter. Um, we did move the retention basin closer to the road, which we could do without any big design modifications. It's only three feet deep, so I'm not really worried about it being closer to the road. And when I say closer to the road, it's still 25 feet from the edge line to the pond. Four to one slope, it's recoverable. You're not gonna fall in a pond. It's not gonna be wet all the time. But his concern, and, and I understand that as, as a property owner, I would feel the same way, is what if we say we got drainage problems on 9B, so we're gonna pick up all the drainage on 9B and take it to this pond that we already have built and own, and it gets overtopped. Um, so I understand where he's coming from. The, the quarter of acre of land has no value that I can certainly identify, except to, to give him peace of mind that um, we won't flood his property out. And why there's some urgency here is that we are not allowed, DEP is not allowing us to even begin permitting on this project until we have all of our easements in place. And because it's an easement, it has to go to town meeting. And we, we thought we'd hit it out of the park with DEP because we had several Zoom meetings with them, and they said, love what you're doing. You're going to treat the water, which you've never done before, you release it slowly into the environment. You're going to get all the stuff out of it, and then realize that we needed this easement. So, John, did you say you heard some complaints about this particular easement, or was it un unrelated? Uh, the land swap. Somebody was concerned about that. Concern. We've already got the easements for that all set, right? All of them but this all one. All of them but yeah. this one. Yeah. But this one. Any questions or comments from the board on this one? In, in the deed that he, we would grant to him, he would not be able to build upon that? It's unbuildable anyway because it's... Well, a, we're expanding his lot line now, so... Yeah, yeah but that doesn't give him any extra <coughs> buildable area. He's, it's an easement. It's, a, it's not an, like an ownership. Well, we, oh, no, we'd we, be giving him the land right, as a fee. buffer. Okay. And he would be giving it us the easement. Yeah. Okay. So it would right. be going in fee, but he, it would not give him enough additional property to be able to make two okay. lots there. Yeah. The only extension that you might be able to make is that potentially he could put a very narrow driveway down there into a, a back lot that he does own. But that back lot, he has no intention of developing it soon, and I think this would be a tough place to put a driveway, especially with his right next to it. Where's the back lot? 
see behind his house, there's quite a bit of land there. 2630. Yeah. Oh, okay. oh on his. On his, on his actual on property. On his land. Okay, so it's not a separate lot. No, it's not a separate lot at this time. He'd have to go through subdivisions. And I think Mike's still here. And if Mike ever gave him a separate driveway, um, I would I would be standing in Mike's office because this is one of those circumstances where you don't need another conflict point coming onto a road. Um, so I, I, the expense of building another driveway would not make sense. Can we put it in the deed when we sign it over that there's no driveway to be put in there? Let's see why. Leah doesn't, she's not shaking her head, no. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't see. I, I, would, I would vote in favor of it so long as that's a caveat to the agreement. Okay. Uh, we can draft that. What I'm looking for for this, just because of that April 5th deadline is, is coming up on us fast, would be if you're open to scheduling a public hearing on this right, at your next right, meeting. Right, right, yep. yeah. I'll take a motion. Oh, Will, okay, can we see the, okay, I make a motion that. Oh, just hold on. You would like to be yeah, able to yeah, see what you're doing? Do you, the, the writing, so. Okay, okay, I make a motion. Um, we're on H, right? Okay. Yes. That we hold a public hearing on a conveyance of a portion of the town land on map and lot 345E in exchange for an easement over a section of private property at map and lot 34-5 on Ridgetop Lane. Second. And we, it we held at, on March 15th at 6 p.m. in the Littlefield Room, 208 Sanford Road. Second. All those in favor? Five no. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is, so we have... Three minutes until the scheduled is this next one a quick one. We can go through this fast. Discussion and possible action on tax abatements. Um, Jody. Jody. <coughs> Just looking real quick. Um, we're getting ready to do some tax foreclosures. These travel trailers are no longer in town, so just want to get them off the books. Yeah. Okay. I'll take a motion. I move to approve the tax abatements as presented by the finance director. Second. All those in favor? Five nothing. Thank you. Next is discussion and action on updates, personnel, and committee assignments, resignations, and issues. Um, the first uh, three being resignations: resignation of Susan Pinnell from the Budget Review Committee, resignation of Karen Ludic from the Dog Park Committee, and resignation of Steve Kenniger from the Comprehensive Plan Update Committee. Um, and we don't need to make a motion except those, right? Uh, next is discussion, action, and acceptations and requests. The first being thirty dollars from various library users to the Wells Public Library. And the second being ten thousand dollars from the Wells Beach Hose Company to the Town of Wells for the Fuel Assistance Program Fund. Nice. I'll take a motion. I move to accept the generous donations and write a letter of thanks to the donors. <coughs> second. All those in favor? Five nothing. Thank you. Uh, next is discussion and action on approving minutes of the February fifteenth, twenty twenty two Select Men's meeting. Any amendments? Thank you again, Cindy. Take a motion. I move for approval of the February fifteenth, twenty twenty two Select Men meeting minutes. Second. All those in favor? Uh, 401. Um, and then can we move up appointment of uh, members to various committees to this section as well? I'll take a motion to appoint the four members that we interviewed tonight. I make a, I, I move to appoint the four members that we interviewed tonight to the term of, to the terms that, that they have and when they expire. It doesn't say, but whatever the terms that are required. Do you have the names? These are the four names, Linda. Yep. Linda. So it's, Linda Grenfeld, Owen Grumling, Kenneth Lowell, Maynard Bridges. Second. All those in favor? Five nothing. Thank you. Uh, next, on to new business. Uh, we are open to the public. Um, if there is anyone that wishes to address the board, I ask you just please keep it brief as we do have a town forum next. Um, is there anyone that wishes to address the board at this time? Seeing none. Uh, moving on to, is there anything? No good news. To? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion we adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Thank you for your patience. Uh, thank you. No <laughs> um, Mr. Hardy, do you ask that I share these with you? Yes. So, um, and then I also, um, do you want to sign now or do you want to sign later? Uh, I've got a minute, so. Sign. Sign. Are we moving? Uh, like a, we sit somewhere else. Everyone else is up here. You guys can sign. I don't have a problem. I sent with color coding. I've got printed ones as well. I have them on here. Thank you. I'm red, right? Yes. And I'm sorry for just assigning you, like, willy nilly, but. They were policy kind of questions that I thought seemed like things that... My favorite was the... Uh, hey, like Mikey. The I, like that that that's a, I didn't want to touch that one. I, I'm happy to take that one. 
I don't want to mention the impact on businesses. Well, was a, if I'm not mistaken, it was a chamber uh, decision to have that initially. Isn't that? You're going to be right up here. Here, I've got copies of the questions that we received. Uh, tell you the truth, right? that's what's going to get us. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Where's Christine? So I was incorrect. I love being wrong. I love being wrong. No, it's good. How are you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, Right. Well, I didn't know there was a to do. Yeah, me too. Right. Me from the ground off. Sorry. Keep this Thank you very much. So I appreciate it. That's it, right? That is it. Okay, good. Reading uh, an exciting event? Yes. So nice to hear good news. Truly. That's wonderful. Hey, thanks. We're going to need it. Rumble. I can't bless this. This is the first first round. Yeah, we will. I think it's on that. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. That's you <laughs> shouldn't have made it. But he did. We're happy. Thank you. She's probably going to have a squeeze of more. I just thought there was going to be more. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Is this yours too? Or? Did you want me? Are you kidding? No. <laughs> I'm sure do. 
personally, no, I want to start with like, writing questions or go on. I want to start with questions as well. Because we may answer that. We may answer that. They're going to get something. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. And then Sean, I also want to. So we don't want to just go in order in the sheet here. Well, how does they connect with us? So Joyce and I were talking about it earlier. Oh, wait, I'm going to come with a reminder. We learned in our first conversation about what is the I don't know what you want to see that. Yeah, I am. Unfortunately, she did not get a chance. Yes, she did get a chance. So I didn't see it. Oh, it's still down. The audio is up on the live stream. It's up on the It's up on YouTube. So we commented on Facebook to let people know to go to other channels. So, but what I can do, Sean, is I can let people know if there's a question that they weren't able to ask this for me and it's not asked for someone else to answer. I'll put up a new one tomorrow. I was going to submit them in writing and post them out as written answers. Do you want? I think we'll just go in order. Yep. And then 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 we'll just go in but I think you had a good point. Repeat questions, we'll mm -hmm. get them out of the way, and maybe alleviate concerns. You're going to we'll do the first couple. We talk together. Okay, so good evening, everyone, and welcome to our uh, first town forum. Uh, something that we hope to do uh, more frequently in the future with other items that come up that are hot topic issues around town. Uh, so thank you all for attending. Um, first, just to tee it up, I'll turn it over to the town manager just to kind of discuss you know, where, how we got to where we are, sure. just some background details uh, before we open it up. Sure. So um, a couple of months ago, we uh, the board invited Sheriff King to come to discuss some of the challenges that we were seeing in town surrounding um, specifically a repeat offender that um, was being arrested by our very excellent police force and then not detained and then unfortunately um, reoffending. And what we learned during that is that we had four commercial, bur uh, four burglaries to commercial properties along Route 1, and all of which our police officers uh, solved. We're really deeply grateful for that. Um, and, but we learned about a national program called Emergency Rental Assistance. And what we learned is that the person that was responsible at the kind of the core center of those four um, burglaries to commercial properties was not staying at one of our hotels, but was visiting one of our hotels that had um, people that were um, that were being supported through the emergency rental assistance program living at them. And so we started to have um, kind of a better understanding of a new population that had moved into town and how that population was being funded. Um, during that conversation with Sheriff King, we also had prior to that, we put out to the public a form that people could fill out and submit their questions. We had a few dozen questions come in, sorted them into buckets. One bucket was um, handled by our um, town attorney, Leah Rakin. One bucket was handled by our police chief, Joanne Putnam. Another was handled by Sheriff King. And then the fourth bucket was handled by the executive director of York County Community Action and myself. Um, so those answers, those questions, every question that was asked both through that form and then also online during that meeting were answered in written form and are put up on our website. Um, wanted to just kick this off by just reminding folks of, of a couple of those answers to give us a framework for this conversation because a lot of the, co the questions that have come in this time using the form that was shared out to the public um, sh uh, I think can be answered to some extent with what we learned in our first conversation. So I think first off, we have um, we know of four hotels in the town of Wells that have been providing housing to people that are paying for that housing using money through th from the emergency rental assistance program. We learned at our last meeting that the emergency rental assistance program is a federal program that was developed very quickly um, in response to COVID as an attempt to provide um, emergency rental funding for folks that had lo um, lost their jobs because of COVID. 
and that this federal government um, distributes the money to Maine through the Maine Housing Authority, and that Maine Housing Authority then distributes the money to each of the county's community action programs. So for us, that's York County Community Action. We also learned that there isn't a program per se. So unlike what we've been seeing in the news this week with South Portland, where Maine Housing contracted with hotels to provide housing, this program is an individual person applying for in emergency rental assistance, finding their own housing, and then working with York County Community Action to have that housing paid for. So it's, there's no contracts with hotels in place. And I think that that's a really important piece that we learned because that's been a lot of the questions have been, why can't we just have them cancel those contracts? There's also been some um, misunderstanding that the town had contracted with these hotels. So what we learned the last time, and I think it's really important to remind ourselves of tonight, individuals apply for emergency rental assistance. They are um, granted access to the program by financial assessment only and then they have to find their housing. And then York County Community Action's role is to set up the direct payment to the landlord. So if I have applied for this program, the money does not come to me personally. I tell York County Community Action, I found housing at this space, and then York County Community Action contacts the owner of that property to set up the payments, okay? So those are some of the things that I think it was just important to go over. Um, it's There isn't a <coughs> program per se, in that there isn't a contract in place or something that um, is a, a point of contact universally. Okay, so I think that's what I would. Yes, so um, we're just gonna start with just the written questions that we got and then we'll move on to live Q&A for everyone that's here. Um, so we got about 15 to go through and um, so we'll just go through those and, and then we'll move on to um, public questions that are for the people that are here. So the first one, I think, is you, Chief Putnam. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the first question that uh, that I'll address is, I heard there was an attempted mugging of an individual leaving the IGA. Is there any way the police can make uh, make statements on this these incidents? Um, older individuals, single women, kids need to be aware of these situations. Uh, there has been no incident of this kind reported to the Wells Police Department. You know, people hear things, you know, don't be afraid to call. I'll tell you one way or the other. Tell you what I can tell you. I always can't give you all the details, but I can at least enlighten you on uh, things that are happening. So, uh, but at this time, no incident has been reported to the Wells Police Department. Thank you, Chief. Um, next question is for town manager. Yeah. Um, so the question was, there are many lodging establishments in town, and it's clear there are a few bad apples. With that said, the majority of lodging businesses have been considerate neighbors and have given back to the community. Does the code office intend on putting a microscope on and making business tougher for the lodging businesses that have played by the rules? Does the town intend on punishing all lodging businesses for the lack of oversight and greed shown by just a couple hotel owners? So this is a meaty <laughs> question with lots of layers. Um, and all of the answers that we provide tonight, we also will be doing what we did before. There will be thorough written answers that are then shared out to the public via our website and other channels that we have. Okay, so don't worry if you don't catch a full answer, we will be releasing them in written form as well. So no, we never have any interest in, in microscoping um, our business community. That's not what we do here in Wells. We have heard though, for the last year, a call to, we had a, a situation last summer where we were, it was brought to our attention that there was an uns, there was a fire code violation at a lodging establishment. Um, so we have heard kind of a consistent multiple times um, interest in making sure that our lodging establishments are secure and meeting code. What um, we are proposing, and, and you'll see coming forward to the board, is a simple five item checklist that the code enforcement and fire department will be working together to check with lodging establishments um, as part of the lodging licensing. Those five items include whether they have working smoke detectors, whether it's there's clearly marked egress that's lighted, whether there are handrails that are in place. Um, there's a couple of other items. They are things that all of our upstanding, considerate lodging establishments do and are not. Um, there's a giant code book of lots of things. That would be a microscope. This is saying, is there a smoke detector in the room that works? Can you get out of the room if there's a fire in a clear path? 
And so that is that is our intention to bring that forward to the board as a proposal um, based on what we have gotten for feedback for the last year of, of interest. All right. Next. Thank you. Uh, next question is, how do we prevent a situation like this from happening again? Um, so I'll take this from the board's perspective. Um, obviously, you know, we weren't completely prepared to handle this situation because it was it was something new that had just come up from the federal government. Um, but we're actively looking at all ordinance language that we can uh, utilize to prevent any abuse of systems like this in the future. Um, so things like looking at ordinance changes for for um, how long you can stay in, in facilities like this under on our programs, uh, things that we're looking at like that um, is really everything that we have in our control uh, under these programs, or no, I guess it's not a, not a program per se, but uh, that's, that's really everything that we have in our control uh, from a town perspective. Um, but we're actively, you know, trying to work with state officials and hopefully, you know, congressional officials as well uh, to get change language. So that way there's, there's better, uh, checks in place to make sure that abusive programs like this do not happen because uh, we don't want to see abusive programs that, that can be good um, because then it just it ruins it for everyone that, that's playing by the rules in these situations. So I'll take the next one. Okay. Um, are general assistance <coughs> residents allowed to have children in the Wells school system? So this is one of the questions that we also answered in the last round. Um, general assistance is separate and distinct from the emergency rental assistance program. General assistance is a state mandated um, social system net. Okay. So anyone who is a resident and resident means, do you live here? Okay? It doesn't mean you own property. It doesn't mean you have a lease. It means, do you live here? Is eligible to come into the town hall and based on financial um, records, be eligible for financial assistance in the form of food, housing, lights, et cetera? Yes, to the question that's being asked. If you, if you physically reside in the town of Wells and you have children in your household, those children are allowed a free and, uh, um, what's the word, free and something education um, in any community, not just Wells, but if you are anywhere <coughs> You have the right to send your child to school, period. All right. The next question is to um, Chief Putnam. Um, uh, sorry. Um, or Leah? Uh, we we no. skipped over one. Do you want me to read it? Right. If, yes. we know where the, yes. uh, if we know where the increase in crime is originating, why can't we station officers there in a show of visible force? I guess, first of all, I don't think I would, visible force is not the words I would choose. Um, but uh, but having more of a concentrated presence in the area, uh, in in the town, requires resources and money. We do do that, um, and we have done that in, in this situation. And it has uh, worked to our advantage, and it's also worked to our advantage you know, uh, working with uh, business owners, residents alike. So uh, we do do that, but again, that is money and uh, resources. As long as we have the resources, we can do it. I'm just going to read. There was a statement. Um, it's not really a question, but I'll just read it into the record for tonight. It just said, I just read all the Q&A that you published. This is after our, our last meeting with Sheriff King. Uh, certainly sounds to most Wells residents that you're just bending over backward to support the transients in town to the detriment of law-abiding, tax-paying citizens. You really should address this because the law-abiding, tax-paying citizens deserve more, more protection, more assurance, more safety, more consideration. Our children, our seniors, our families deserve nothing less. Um, then the next two questions go to uh, Leah. Great. So I'm just going to read them. Um, the first question is, if the transients are homeless and are receiving housing through a government entity, can they be required to have random drug testing as a condition of staying in the hotels? And if found using drugs, can they be evicted? So lots of questions there to unpack. Um, <laughs> The first thing I would say is that it talks about receiving housing through a government entity. So the question, I know this is such a typical lawyer answer, but it depends. It depends on the program. And so with respect to GA, I don't believe that there is a, drug a random drug testing capacity under GA. Um, it used to be the case under state law for TANF, which is, I think, temporary assistance for needy families. It used to be the case that um, drug testing was allowed. Now, I think that um, I was actually in preparing for this. I, I read an interesting thing that between 2015 and 2018, when that um, the, the testing was done, they found that only, I think, 10 um, 
10 tests came back positive, and so they decided from just a cost and efficiency and resource standpoint that it didn't make sense to continue that program. And so that um, provision in the statute that allows for drug testing for TANF has been actually repealed. So under TANF, that is not the case. Um, I can't speak to the rental assistance program. It's not a program, um, but I would imagine <laughs> that it is not allowed. And so, again, it depends. And I would say even if that were allowed, the drug testing w was allowed, it's a separate and distinct process, um, legally speaking, for eviction. Eviction is separate. If a landlord is not being paid or a lease is being violated for, for any reason, they can actually go and ask a court to evict a, a tenant. So um, they're separate and they're uncoupled. But if there is things like, you know, non-payment of rent, if there are things like vandalizing or treating the property improperly, then that is a ground for eviction and a landlord, any landlord, whether it be a hotel or, or any property owner, can go to the court and ask for an eviction. Oh, you I'm next, next as well. Right? Right. Um, does the town of Wells currently have any laws or ordinances regarding vagrancy that would prohibit people from setting up campsites and other temporary living um, spaces on public lands? The answer to that is um, there's a specific provision, I think, in the beaches <laughs> part of the ordinance that says you can't camp on beaches. And there's also another section of the code specifically de um, devoted to loitering. And loitering is broadly defined as basically being somewhere alone or with others. Pretty broad definition. But you have to be there for a lawful purpose. And so it does define public places where loitering is not allowed expansively to talk about not just private property, but public <coughs> parks, public ways, sidewalks, those kinds of things. And so I think that as far as the ordinances go with respect to loitering, that <coughs> if um, what was happening was uh, interfering with a public way or people could not get around or, or move around, I think that those ordinances can be used for, um, you know, not allowing public camping. And so I think they exist. Now, an entirely separate question, which I'm not going to ramble on too much uh, on, is whether or not those are enforceable. There are lots of cases all across this country with respect to loitering, with respect to urban camping, which, you know, you've seen in Portland. I actually was in the other Portland last weekend, um, and there's a huge problem with, with urban camping. And so these, these are, it's almost like a to be continued because this exact question that is being asked is being litigated across the country, um, and not surprisingly, depending on where, um, the courts are, are actually coming down on, on different sides. So there you go for another it depends answer, but <laughs> that's the state of the law right now. It's not necessarily settled. Thanks, Leah. Sure. Next one is town manager. Uh, is it possible to be more cohesive in placing people of same circumstance with like people? So the question is written, in, I think I'm going to interpret it for you because it's written in, in kind of choppy, but defined. So I think that they're asking, can we house people that are homeless by choice together? Can we house people that are homeless due to COVID-related income loss together? Can we house people that are quarantined because of COVID together? And can we house people that are in need of rehabilitation treatments together? And the answer is no. Because of the way that this program works, each individual is responsible for finding their own housing and then applying for funding through York County Community Action. So the well town of Wells absolutely has no authority to do that. But the way that the program is set up doesn't allow for that either because there isn't a centralized program. There's a centralized funding. Thank you. Uh, next one's uh, just a statement. It says, it seems to me that if you have a group of continuously disruptive people, it gives a misconception on all inhabitants. There is a definite need for assistance for unexpected situational life changes, not because you don't feel like working. Uh, and then the next three are on to you, Chief. <laughs> uh, does the Wells Police Department have an action plan to address the rise in crime as the South Portland Police Department discussed on the news? And uh, I did go back and watch that interview again Is in South Portland... Uh, does not have an action plan. They are going to discuss one. But uh, we don't, uh, I guess my short answer to that is, we do not have an action plan that addresses the increase in crime specifically, as there are many different uh, situations that require different approaches. We try to use whatever resources we have available to us to take care of a situation. That may be other agencies, other town departments, 
um, residents and or business owners. You know, there's there's many resources that that we use um, within our agency, with other agency, neighboring departments, again, other town departments, whoever, <coughs> whatever we need to get the situation corrected, we try to do that. Um, is there oh, is it? There's never one solution for every problem. So that's that's the approach that we take. Yeah, you get the next two. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to find my answer. No. Uh, the increased crime stemming from the state lodging program at local hotels such as USAN and others has put an additional burden on the excellent and valuable police force. Does the town bill back, in quotes, the state for additional man hours or staff time? <laughs> I'll correct that. Um, uh, for additional items and officer calls incurred as a result of the problems with this program. Uh, we do not uh, bill back the state at this time. There's, well, we don't at all right now. That is something that the town, uh, I believe the select board is going to have to look into if they want to go down the road of nuisance properties. Don't know if they want to do that or not. I do have some examples of them. I've done a little bit of research and there is there are mechanisms in some of the ordinances for or for sanctioning the different uh, nuisance properties. So at this time, uh, we do not bill back. Uh, what was the crime statistics before the program started at the Wells Inn, and what was last year's statistics for crimes at this time? Um, they have increased. Um, I do have tons of stats. I have uh, Captain Kevin Chapman that works for me, loves numbers. He loves running stats and having those. And I appreciate it because it's not one of my uh, favorite things. But uh, So they have increased but not statistically significant uh, due to the decrease in crimes in other parts of the town of Wells. So um, there are numbers, there are figures, and I have them. And I don't bore you with all the numbers, but you're more than welcome. And we may even put some of those up on our um, on the page. And when we answer these questions, we'll try to maybe even insert one or two of them, uh, which you may find interesting. Thank you, Chief. Uh, next one's for the board. Uh, will the town manager be willing to submit a letter to Maine's U.S. congressional delegation describing the issues our town is having with the ERA program? Seems to me there has to be feedback to the program originators and, ca and accountability at the ballot box. Um, I'm guessing I could probably speak to the board that that's something that we would be willing to do as we already sent letters to the state uh, officials. So I would see no issue why the board wouldn't want to do it for um, the con U.S. congressional delegation. So I, my answer would be yes, we will most likely do that. Uh, next one is Jodine. Jodine. Um, who in the town of Wells made the decision that these seasonal hotels can be open when they have seasonal licenses? So the license themselves is not... Uh, does not say seasonal on it. It's actually based on the use of the site plan. So it does not come from the business license. The business license is very clear. It's just a type of use. The site plan is another whole game of um, finding out who actually, when it was approved, and site plans go back as far as the early 80s. And sometimes they are approved when the planning board would actually say the 28-day rule, um, 30 days, leave for five days, it has, and sometimes it's not clear at all. Sometimes you have to actually look at the original site plan, and then three site plans later, it will jump and tell you again that they're doing that. So it's a very long process to figure out exactly how people are open and closed. And we don't usually have the time to go and look at these site plans until things arise or they go back before the planning board for an amendment. And that's how we find them. So if they're not supposed to be open and they're open, when we find out about it, we don't allow them to open any longer. What we are doing is we're doing a, um, a, a very um, detailed study, and it's taken quite a bit of man hours right now, and we're going to figure out which ones of actually the traditional hotels. And when I say traditional hotels, that means the 28 hotels that are owned by uh, companies. They aren't condominium-owned. And that would consist of about um, 1,077 units. And we're going to find out exactly how those units are supposed to be operated. And once we figure that out, we'll send letters to those companies 
and we'll tell them how they're supposed to open this coming year. So this fall, if they're supposed to be closed in January and February, we will expect them to be closed in January and February. And so that's how we're going to handle seasonal licenses moving forward. It's just the seasonal uses based on the site plan of the property. All right, next one is Town Manager. Uh, why can't you ask the hotels in question to stop accepting these intransigence a la South Portland? Um, so the town hasn't, so we don't really have the authority to ask our businesses who they serve and who they don't serve. And I think that that is a good policy in general. Uh, what we have done, and I really want to give full credit to Chief Putnam for this, is reached out to the hotel owners that have folks staying at their hotel that we think are, are really causing some problems. Um, she has done a great job fostering relationships with those hotel owners, and they have been very, very cooperative. Um, Chief Putnam, do you want to talk about the decrease in number of folks that are staying? Yeah, in, in working with the, uh, the whole... Uh, establishment owners, they have uh, <clears throat> taken some suggestions and actually given us some suggestions on how to combat some of the issues. They uh, they don't like seeing us at their establishment any more than we like being there. So uh, it's kind of been twofold here, but uh, they it has decreased. I know out of the two, one gentleman that owns two of the establishments is down to 25 people, when at the beginning he was over 40. So um, he is not accepting any new people on the, it's not a program. It's using a, the ERA. Using funds. the ERA, we call it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, he's, you know, and he, he says, when, you know, before all this started, I had a good reputation. I want my good reputation back. So he, he, uh, he sees what this does. I think he has had homelessness as family in the past, and I think he saw this as a way to give back. Um, what he didn't anticipate were people that take advantage of these programs, uh, these, the, uh, the rental <laughs> assistance. <laughs> um, but uh, it, and it did happen, and he's, he has seen that now, and we have enlightened yeah. him uh, quite a bit. Uh, he, he actually was, uh, has hired um, security guys, has an on-site security person, and then on that person days off, has someone else come in. So... Uh, he was, he's been willing to work with us right from the start once we found out about the program. So, <laughs> uh, it's going to be another word we can yeah. use. Just go for program. <laughs> Just go for program. Situation. Uh, situation. Situation, yeah. So he's been, and again, this is another instance of working with, you know, establishment owners, business owners, residents, um, and talking with the residents, find out what they're seeing. Because we can't be everywhere all the time, you know. Um, some of the local residents in the area of these units have been very helpful. And I know I said before, I see something, say something, and I get it. People don't want to get involved, but we, we can't do it all. Public safety can't do it all. We need help from others too. And I'd love to say we could do it all, but I'm, I try to be a realist. So. I think you're the next. Oh, I'm next. Oh. Uh, uh, having more fun, full time police officers. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is a great question. <laughs> Thanks for whoever put it. <laughs> <laughs> With the increase of people in town, we will be voting to add more full time police officers. Uh, uh, the answer is no on that one in this year's budget. Yep. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, no, it is not uh, slated to be on the ballot this June, but hopefully in the near future, as the population has increased by over 18% uh, using the new census numbers. Our calls for service have grown steadily over the last several years, actually more than doubling since 2005. Over the last few months, we have been looking at staffing needs of the department, and um, we have not added a, a patrol officer in over 20 years. So we've done as much as we have with uh, I, what I consider short staff. <coughs> the, uh, we have added two school resource officers, totally different. They're not on the street every day. They're in the schools, which I think is a great program. I'm glad we have it, you know, to foster that relationship with the students and the teachers and um, uh, things like that. So that is a great program. Uh, so this is, it is a delicate topic too, because added officers means uh, more money. Uh, and I like to keep the taxpayers in mind. Uh, when asked, when 
discussing adding offices, but we also have to consider the public safety aspect of things. So I'm hoping in the future we will uh, be coming to you. But so uh, how many offices, how, oh, how many would be ideal to Chief Putnam? Well, <laughs> Sally, did you want to help me with this? <laughs> I think you're doing just fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, in reality, I would really like to add three officers that would allow for more coverage town-wide, uh, especially when we have things like this where we can co have one officer concentrate on this area and when we still have, you know, 64 square miles to, to take care of. So that would cover, uh, allow more coverage town-wide and I'll allow officers to spend more time on investigations. You know, unfortunately, the, the call volume has gone up so much that, um, and... I don't know, unfortunately, I guess, the investigations are becoming so um, intricate and they take so much time that it takes the officers off the street. And that's not fair to the taxpayers because you want the people on the street, I get it, 100%. Um, so they're allowed to spend more time on investigations. Uh, we stretch pretty thin because of the call volume and then lengthy, uh, lengthy time-consuming caseload. We hope to have a presentation for the for the select board um, in the near future. It's it's come to the point where we just can't um, keep going with what we have. It's and I know I get it. I'm a taxpayer in another community. Whenever and I, I cringe when I see oh we want to add this this and this and I look at dollar signs. But we try to do as much as we can with as you know as little money as we can. And, you, and that's why you try different approaches, as I spoke about using other other people. So hopefully I answered the question. Maybe more than you wanted to hear, but... Did you write that question? To no, I wish I had. <laughs> I, just like found, I just got it today. <laughs> yeah, just teasing, yeah. Um, next question is to Jim Apollo. Did you want to answer mine because you're too right? <laughs> uh, the question is, what, if anything, is being done to address the overdoses which have happened at the local hotels? What overdoses? People like to use the term overdose as a general catch-all term for drug or illicit substance abuse or use. Since October of uh, 2021 till the end of February, we've only been to one instance that had drugs involved at these establishments. That's not to say there's not drugs there. That's not to say that the people aren't under the influence of a mind-altering substance, but we haven't been there for overdoses. We just haven't. Um, our, the way we deal with overdoses is emergency care first, get them into the hospital so that they're into the hospital network system for support and um, different medications that they can use and therapies and things like that to help um, wean them off their addiction or break their addiction. So that's what we do for overdoses. Thank you, Jim. All right. Um, do we want to turn this over to open in the public? Sure. Um, just we can get to the rest of the questions later if we have time. But um, if there's anyone that wishes to ask a question uh, right now, you can come up to the podium. Please just state your name, uh, and, and you can ask ask a question of of any of us. And we do have more questions to go through, and we yeah. can do those afterwards. But if you have something, yeah. some burning question. <laughs> there you go, Lynn. <laughs> Uh, Lynn Freeman, um, has there been any recovery of stolen property in the past six months? On the burglars that we had, uh, we, I believe we, uh, eight of the nine bicycles, if I remember correctly, had been, were recovered, returned to the business owner. Uh, whether he can sell those as new bicycles now? Probably not. So there is a loss, and, and, and there's also uh, the cash gone, you're not going to see that again. If you find any little giant ladders, I've lost two of them. <laughs> <laughs> we'll look. Thanks. Thanks. Anyone else have any questions? I'm Mo Rooney, uh, and my wife Carol is here. <laughs> We're new to Wells. We built up a home here about 15 months ago it moved in. You might understand that the people that lived in these in these motels, it, it could be a year-round thing. They're going to be mingled with people at the summertime, that holiday here. Is that correct? I would, yes. <laughs> there was a question later on, but um, 
I know I have spoken with the one owner that I have the best you know relationship with here, and his his answer was I should read this text, but uh, one of the motels who does not plan on it unless uh, they are working for his establishment, and I think he's maybe. It, it, but you're going to remember they're not. Some of these are well deserving people. Yeah, not I, I can't put a face on. on yeah. any no, no, no. People. I get. That. I only know what I hear in the news. Yep. And he is, his thought process is if they're um, actually it's probably better just to read his text. Sure, it's probably easier because he kind of explains himself um, a little bit. Uh, he said, "So I asked him, are you planning on having people that are on the rental assistance uh, program at your motels this summer?" He says, "Not particularly. I may keep a few good ones with." Uh, with job and no trouble with the law. Uh, more like who can help me with cleaning hotel rooms. So he's looking at, so he's trying to look at and maybe even helping someone get off, find a place, make enough money so they can find a place. So, and again, some of these are well-deserving people. I'm not going to say they all are at all, but at least he's looking for maybe a solution to someone's problem. Right. And I believe the others are in the same boat because they look at it and um, is what they can get for a room now versus what they can get for a room in mid, you know, middle of the summer, which is usually a lot more money. Uh -huh. oh, so, um, again, I only know what I've seen on the news. Yeah, no, um, that's all. And I read uh, today another article on the news about this thing in South Portland that, that happened. And I, I had to read it four times that in 2019, the Days Inn called the police department of South Portland 40 times, mm -hmm. and in 2021, they called 800 and something. So my concern is that if this is going to be a program that stays year after year and Channel 13 opens their 6 o'clock news with our crime, you're going to see your property values go down. And it, doesn't take, it doesn't take a genius to figure that out. And that's my concern. I, I just built a home here. Yeah. It took us 21 years to build. You know, you'll be able to do it. We work around the clock to keep it. And, well, I agree with you 100%. Your job is, to, it, is, you know, the homeowners, the taxpayers, the people that pay the bills in this town. Yep. It, it can't stand. I, I don't want to go to Hannaford's and get panhandled for money. My car get broken into. That's not where I want to live. Yeah. No, and I understand that. Okay. Um, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask a follow-up question? Okay. Yeah, of course. Uh, there's something I learned to, um, today, or just, just this evening, so this is really helpful, was that this is kind of coming from the federal government, and one of the questions would be, is the town manager or the board going to reach out to the U.S. representatives? Um, and I was just curious, uh, sometimes like grassroots, like people living in the town, contacting the U.S. representative can be helpful. So is that something that we could do as residents to kind of reach out on the federal level and talk about the, pit, the pitfalls of the small meeting program? And if you had any talking points or anything that if you were going to contact them, if we could like spread it out so we could get the community to kind of reach out? Make phone calls. You know, we, we will absolutely, as a, a board, explore that. And, and <coughs> most likely, I, I, you know, I can look over to the board members here tonight. I, I will send a letter um, to the to the U.S. Um, Congress delegation. Um, but in terms of what, you know, local taxpayers can do, that's absolutely always something that can be done. I know they have office hours, too. You know, so, you know, phone calls, emails, whatever. It, it all helps um, just to hear that there's more support than just, just the board, you know, sending something along. Um, so, yeah, I absolutely think that would be helpful. Sean, but can I add to that? Yeah. I think I also heard a question of, you know, could we provide you with talking points, et cetera, to, to make that communication easier? What we can do is certainly share the letter that this, the board writes um, and share that out to the public so that you're seeing what the board has sent, and if that helps with kind of framing your own message. Um, and we can also make sure that it's easy to find on our website the contact information for the congressional delegation. That would be great. I think the more people mm -hmm. I've heard that that can really make a difference. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead. Yeah. frame it again. Um, have these um, crimes that you've been discussing, are they related at all to the uh, number of mailboxes that have been vandalized and stolen in the past couple of weeks? The past couple of weeks. Uh, we do have suspects in those. Two out of the three suspects have been summoned. Um, they had nothing to do with the motel. Okay, so there's, and, and the other part of my question is, is the increase in crime that's been seen over the past, what, decade and a half, I think you said, 
Um, has it been primarily on businesses or has it been in, in residential areas as well? I mean, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me. Uh, it's, it's, it's a mixture. I mean, we have, plus we have more residents in Wells. So you're going to have, you know, your numbers a little skewed. But a lot of it, you remember, we have the transient community or the, the tourist community where you have unoccupied dwellings and stuff in, in the off seasons, which now and again over the years have been hit. Um, but I, I can't say it's huge one way or the other, to be honest with you. Which leads me to my next question is, um, is as a homeowner in another in another town as well, um, would it be is it suggested to the homeowners that they let the police department know when the building is going to be vacated for a period of time? Yeah, we have a vacant uh, property program. We have a form that you can fill out, and we keep an eye on it. Try to mm -hmm. dr do drive bys as we have time. Um, to do those. And I can't guarantee they're going to be there, you know, every eight hours or every other day. But at least we try to keep an eye on it uh, for the days that you're gone. Okay. Great. Thanks. I'd like to say something. Yeah. <coughs> My name is Charles Haverly. Um, I have what's called a unique perspective of all this because I run a hotel in Kenny Bunk for the last 15 years. <clears throat> These people are 100% correct. The, the program that's coming from your community action, just so you know, it is an 18 month program. The money can go up to $1,500 per week in rental assistance, depending upon their financial programs. However, I can tell you, uh, this young lady right here, the, the chief of police, I certainly put my name down when I go out of town. They don't do on a consistent basis, but I live at the end of a road and the likelihood of anybody coming down there will be slim to none. But this is exactly what I wanted to tell people was that this is a community and clearly everyone cares. And clearly they're standing up and say, hey, what's going on? How can we fix this? Know that the hotels that originally took these people in, I think to help, but in some of them, they were incredibly short-sighted because they saw revenue coming in where it was none before. And I know that because I know the people that own these hotels personally. However, most of them are trying to fix the problem. They really don't want this problem to exist anywhere in this town at all. Um, and they are trying to be part of the community as well. But again, the sad part is I sort of knew this was going to happen in November, right? And I should have told the town of Wells, but I didn't know what was happening here. For example, I happen to know people that are in Walgreens, and people are just taking stuff off the shelf. It's not every day. But it does happen, just as crime happens everywhere else. We do not have this problem at Kenny Bunk, mostly because I'm there. And I would never tolerate it. For example, there was an issue yesterday. I was there. He's gone. I don't mess around. Right? And when I took over 15 years ago, I let everybody know there's a new sheriff in town. Right? So I don't tolerate that. And I think that's where this has to come from. It has to come from the people that own the properties. I know you're limited about what you can do, but it sounds like that some of them are actually getting on board and trying. But know that if they wanted to, it's highly unlikely they will now because of all the, the reaction from everybody. But if they wanted to, they can keep them there from the 18 months from the time they first came. And there's absolutely zero you can do about it. This program is sadly was trying to help people but didn't understand what was going to happen and some of the people you might attract. They're 100% because I did Christmas for all those people in that town, in, in that USAN, and I can tell you that majority of people were very, very nice. As a matter of fact, the hotel that I run in Kennebunk is actually taking people in through either general assistance program uh, on Thursday, whose house burnt down. So we are trying to help as best we can, but the general assistance is completely different than the York Community Action. This is a federal program that unfortunately you're going to be required, the town to get together, the people get together, and write to your congressmen and other state representatives to fix this. If you don't fix it, prime example, as I said, I live on a road that's a dead end. I actually upgraded my security system. Not because I'm right here by Route 1, I'm not. I'm three miles away, well, two and a half miles away. But I did it because I was fearful of something bad happening. And well, from my perspective, $39 a month didn't kill me, right? So at the end of the day, everybody was safe. But 
I think everybody here should get seriously. You guys are really doing a great job. I've been watching from afar. I've been talking to your general assistance people. I've been talking to the people down at the DMV. You're limited about what you can do because they don't wear signs that say, hey, I'm a drug user or I'm a thief or I'm any of those things. And sadly, you're fighting against them. And quite frankly, if you raise my taxes to get the police, I have no problem with that. So. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'll remember that. <laughs> I got one vote. Write my name. You get more try now. Thank you very much for your comments. Anyone else that had any questions? If not, we can go back to the written ones. But sorry. yeah, go ahead. My name is Jacqueline Simons, um, and I live down on Atlantic Ave. <clears throat> And I, I make a point of saying that because I've been heavily questioned online. If you haven't noticed about where I live, I do own property in Kennebunk Port as well, but that's occupied by tenants. Um, so just putting that to bed because it has been uh, a source of great interest for people for some reason. Uh, in any event, a lot of my questions have been answered and I appreciate that. And I truly appreciate the fact that this forum was brought together to begin with. Um, do we have a representative from your county community action here? No. We don't. And not, nor, nor from the housing. No. Okay. That takes away some of my questions. <laughs> but just give me a moment here. If you, um, submit, can, yeah. if you send them, um, I feel confident we can get them answered. Okay. I mean, one of, my, one of my questions, and you may know the answer to some of this, um, as part of this, uh, it has been asked repeatedly whether or not background checks could be done. I was told by one of the hotel owners who is involved in the programs that if he did that, he would be acting as a landlord. And therefore, he would not be able to trespass people from his property. He would have to go through an eviction process. Is that accurate? Leah, yeah, do you want to tackle that? No. I, I, I don't frankly, so. I, I just don't know the answer to that question. I mean, that's, that's a very I'm just throwing it out there and yeah. like, if you could give a written answer yeah. to that, I, yeah. I would appreciate it. Yeah. I, I, so I can we clarify, if, though? Yeah. Like, yeah. So, so the landlord? The, so the, the I mean, landlord, the, the, what, what, so um, your county community action did answer this question prior from, a, from the York County community action standpoint. The answer is no. no. They can't. Okay. They, they cannot. So uh, I'm. So is the question about whether or not a landlord can conduct a background check if without triggering owners, a tenant issue? Right. If the hotel okay. owners are acting as landlords mm -hmm. and accepting rent relief, can they be required to do background checks on these individuals? No, I, I can answer that question. Okay. I mean, right. if, if, if we're just talking basic landlord-tenant law, mm -hmm. and I'm a municipal attorney, sure. you know, so <laughs> I, I, I'm telling you 101 what I learned in law school okay. maybe the first week. Okay. <laughs> so, so with respect to landlord and tenant relationships, those relationships are governed by a lease, okay? I'm going to go, and I don't know the answer to this question, I'm going to go out on a limb and, and, and assume, and you know what they say about assuming, but assuming that there is no lease, then there's um, tenancy at, at, at will, and then statutory provisions prevail. I don't think there's anything that requires a landlord to conduct a background check. I think maybe it could be a part of the lease that would allow that to happen, but there's nothing that I'm aware of that requires a background check. No. Arguably, a prudent landlord might ask to do that, and then there are all sorts of legal complications for doing background checks. It has to be consented to, et cetera. I'm yeah. sure Chief could speak to that. But okay, because what uh, the discussion was between he and I was that why aren't you doing background checks? And the answer was because I could not then trespass somebody immediately from the property. Because I mean, and, and again, I, I'm not an expert on this, but but. Maybe there isn't a landlord-tenant relationship. Maybe it is because it's a lodging facility. There's not a tenancy. Those are, I, I just don't know the answer And that brings that. me back to yeah. the basis of the program. I'm going to use the word. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you know, if the basis of the program is that it's rent release, relief, um, I'm somewhat familiar with that program. I've familiarized myself. Uh, I know that landlords do have to sign an agreement to not evict someone during the time that they're paid for, so forth and so on. Uh, so how are hotel owners being treated as a landlords? How do they qualify for this funding to begin with? And I was hoping that we'd have someone 
from the housing here tonight so that I could ask that question. Yeah. But if we get some clarification of that. We, that question you had earlier. I think so, a little bit. So um, we, we had a question that was, if someone is enrolled in the ERA program and is removed from the hotel where they are staying because of criminal or disruptive behavior, are they also removed from the program? Because that was one of the questions from before. And I think the answer a little bit speaks to what you're asking, okay? Uh, we were told from YCCAC, the ERA program is designed to provide temporary financial assistance for individuals and families in Maine facing housing instability. They are not so much enrolled as they are applicants who are approved and not um, or not based on their financial circumstances. Tenants may request up to three months of help with rent, and if circumstances do not improve, they may return for additional assistance. The financial assistance goes directly to the landlord or hotel owner. The landlord or hotel owner has the authority to lawfully decline to rent to them. So I, I think that speaks a little bit to your question, that it, um, at least what we understood before, is that the land, the the there is no contract in place between the federal funding and the landlord. It's at a, a at-will basis, and the, the relationship can be severed at any point if behavior is disruptive. The landlord has the authority, especially in a hotel situation, where there's no protections from a tenancy standpoint, to say, and we've seen that here in Wells repeatedly, you're done. And that money stops going to that landlord. Yeah, I was hoping the housing could answer, or YCCA, or whatever, could answer whether or not these hotel owners are having to sign the landlord agreement? No. no. Not that I'm not. Not that and I'm we have got no indication that that is no happening. That. Because it's actually, York County Community Action. Action doesn't find the housing for these people. They find their own housing. Unless, you know, I, they did say, I spoke with the director and she said once in a while someone can't find anything. They're actually referring people right now to New Hampshire because there's no housing. So, and, and part of that's, and he's one of the people here aren't taking people anymore. And uh, his numbers are down. But that's, that's our understanding is, is that it's, it's no, there's nothing between. It, it seems like just to try to distill it yeah. down to its essence, the, the, the not program is a funding <laughs> mechanism, yes. nothing else. That's it. Which then allows two consenting parties, whether it be landlord and tenant or a hotel owner and guest or whatever, um, and they would be governed by the laws that govern those relationships. I mean, to me, again, I'm speaking, I, I, I think from everything I'm hearing, that sounds like the way it works. But as far as the niceties or the finer points, I don't know if any of us can speak to that. Have any of you actually seen the wording of the program or lack thereof, the funding, the qualifications for the funding. Have you seen any of that in writing? I have not. Where would I be able to view that? I would I've zoom through YCC. He's probably, he's probably a great I resource. Have. <laughs> I have. No, in you fact, have when they it. attempted to reach out to us mm -hmm. to put people in the program, it's a little bit more entailed than that. They ask for your financial, which make your all this stuff. Uh, however, the young lady is correct. They are all tenants at will. A period. So there is no lease. But so if they wanted to, they can say, hey, listen, but they do have, I think it's a 30 day window. They have to get, again, this was back in November. I think it was a 30 day window. You have to give them and tell them to leave. Unless, of course, it's a repeated police in, intervention, then unfortunately they, are, they can leave at any time and they lose the remaining of the money. Um, but there is no lease and they are a tenant at will. And like I said, and these young folks said that, sorry, but in any case, that they need to get the state to fix that. They need to change the wording, as it was said in the very beginning. Because if you don't, they're going to continue doing what they are. I don't think it will continue happening here. I think there's so much an outcry. People are really going to be on top of this. That's my personal opinion. Sorry. Yeah. And in, correct me if I'm wrong, the motel owners can have their, their list of do's and don'ts. Correct. And if you have those do's and don'ts and they uh, violate any of those, there's yeah, but I, and I think that's the difference, though, that's between a guest exactly. and, or slash invitee, to throw out some legal <laughs> jar jargon, versus a tenant. tenant. Because those relationships are tenants. different. And even with a tenancy yeah. at will, there still are statutory requirements before eviction can happen, as opposed to a guest or invitee, which is not a tenancy. Yeah. Which is why I'm asking the question. Yeah, that and I'm I, I, don't, I don't know the terms I, of the per I the very much would like to see at what level and see the actual wording of how this money was intended to be spent. spent. Yeah. 
So if anyone can come up with that, well, I can, or can ask the right people, I would appreciate I can that. give you the director's name, uh, uh, Jackie Watts. And how do I reach that person? At the York County Community Action. Okay. She's actually the director of the program. I've, I spoke with her, I've spoken with her a couple times. Uh, very helpful in explaining the whole program to me and uh, what we can and can't do. She doesn't have it, maybe she can tell me who does. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> <laughs> So we all know that hotel rooms have proven to be a really poor substitute for a homeless shelter. I mean, I think that goes without saying. Are yeah. support services out there surrounding these people at all? Are, they, are, are there people working to get these people training jobs? Back on I would say they reach out. I mean, I don't That think. is what we were. So that was a question that was asked in our first round. And the, and the answer was that, again, because this is, a, as, as Leah said, it's a funding mechanism, okay? If YCCAC learns of other challenges that people are having in the course of conversation, they then do have resources that they try, they offer to connect them to. Okay, so if in the course of discussion, they discover that they have substance abuse disorders that they are looking to treat, they have avenues to help them access that. If they learn that they um, have, you know, challenges with meeting other basic needs than housing, they have ways to support that or mental illness, trying to connect them with the resources that for um, supporting that. But there isn't, there are not social workers attached to um, the people that are receiving this assistance. So it's not like um, they are meeting with somebody once a month to assess where they are. That is absolutely not what's happening. This is a funding mechanism only. Um, and that's what it is. So general assistance or no, there are no social services directly from the town, health officer, or anyone reaching out to these people? We do not have social services in the town, okay? So we have general assistance, but that is, a fine, again, a funding mechanism. It's only there to fund housing, heat, food. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's not... It just seems to be a very large disconnect to me, but... <clears throat> there is, and I'll tell you, we've developed... Um, uh, what we call a help card. And we will hand these out if we go to calls and we see there's some, they need something. Mm -hmm. There's nothing we can do the, for them, nothing general assistance can do for them, but here's a, here's a list of resources, phone numbers, call. So, I mean, we're, we're trying to go down that road and, and at least let them know what's out there for them. And, and I think that's important because they have to want to help the two, want the help. So that's that's an important part also. Absolutely. When someone presents to general assistance here, on again away from the program, um, <clears throat> how how are they directed as far as finding a location to stay? Are they given a list of hotels where the voucher is taken? So a couple of different questions that I'm hearing there. So we ha vouchers are not general assistance, okay? So um, in emergency situations, both PD and the town, you know, we have um, vouchers through Salvation Army. Army, yep. Okay, that are for hotels, like if you if you lose your house in a fire, mm -hmm. okay? Um, for general assistance, a couple of things happen. One, it's entirely financially based, okay? There, there, there are no, pro there's no right of the town to conduct those background checks or drug screenings of any form, okay? We look only at how much money is this household bringing in and how many people are in this household. And I think it's really important for people to hear, general assistance maximums are super crazy low. If you are a household of two people, you are eligible, I think it is $1,032 a month all in, okay? That's for everything. And as all of us in this room know, you cannot possibly live on $1,032 a month. All right. So there are housing maximums. There are food maximums. There, okay. There's, there's maximums. So um, our GA can connect them to additional resources. Okay. So connecting them to St. Mary's Food Pantry, for instance, that would helping them access community-based resources that are there to support um, in those ways. We do not have though um, the resources to if, if somebody um, is exhibiting signs of mental illness, okay? Our GA system is not designed to connect them to the resources that would help them with that. We might reach out to PD and say, hey, can we collaborate on this? But they don't have a social worker at PD either. 
Okay, so there, it, the people present to GA, if they meet the financial requirements, they receive the financial assistance. Now, if they come to us and they are homeless, they, they walk in the door, they're like, we have no place to stay. We will contact a hotel in the town of Wells until we find one that is willing to accept them. All right. And house them in that hotel. But again, their maximum is $1,032 for the month. That's not enough to cover a hotel using GA funding. I can't ask YCCA the same question because obviously they're not here. Um, but I do wonder whether or not they are providing lists to these individuals. Again, a question I'll have to ask them. Yeah, and I, I will tell you the word the word gets around. Oh, of amongst these people, right? I might tell you that right now. <laughs> they know because people come. Hey, I hear that I hear such and such is taken in homeless people. And I'm going to go Just try to get that. Yes. Well, but I think it's also really important to notice to mention, according to YCCAC, every town in coastal, I mean, Saco, Old Orchard, <coughs> Biddeford, Wells, everyone is is has somebody that is receiving the, um, housing assistance through the ERA, and so it's it's not specific Just to us. Wells. No, I understand that okay. completely. As a matter of fact, I learned today, Algonquin has two hotels. Yes, they do. <laughs> <laughs> you said it, not me. <laughs> um, I also have a question about the existing ordinance here in town about hotels as residents and why those standards are not being enforced. So I can speak to the ordinance itself. Enforcement decisions are outside of the scope, and that's that's another question entirely. But um, I think as Jodine really in detail talked about is that there are those criteria for, depending upon when the, the establishment was approved, there are different requirements, right? Um, some say 28 days, some talk about 14 days, you know, defines transient as 90 days. So there's, there's different definitions depending on. Um, and enforcement is an entirely different question. Um, you know, I, I think one of the questions in the last go round was, does the town have to enforce? Well, the law, I will tell you, is extremely clear. Same thing with, with police. Um, you don't have to enforce, given the fact, as Chief said, limited resources, um, policy decisions, where you're going to put your resources. So, um, the towns can make decisions to enforce, but then they have to figure out how to do that in the most efficient and resource-focused way. My question comes because the ordinance, as written, says the Board of Selectmen shall enforce, not may. I will tell you that the word shall enforce is, it's, you cannot compel, it's very clear law, that you cannot compel a town to enforce. I'm not saying that this town is not willing to enforce its ordinances. I'm just telling you what the law says. I also want to be clear. A, a hotel that has a 28-day rule, it doesn't mean that the person has to leave the property at the end of 28 days. They can simply be moved to a different room. Or if you're a hotel owner who happens to own two hotels in town, right? they finish their 28 days at Hotel A, and they are moved to Hotel B for the next 28 days and go back and forth. And they are therefore following the, the law. And, and the other thing about the shall enforce, when it talks about the board shall, as opposed to the planning board or the code mm -hmm. officer, or I, I think it's more delegating that authority to the board that has the responsibility for that, rather than thou shalt, yeah. must, every case. The other piece of that ordinance that I've not heard discussed, I've heard about the moving of people and so forth. Um, and we talked briefly, I think, in the last question and answer session, maybe about school children. But there's another piece of it that uh, deals with the, the address, the mailing address for the person. And by definition, if you're being funded by the government, the government sees your address as that hotel. And that's part of that ordinance that's not being enforced. What? I'm not sure I'm not looking for an answer on that necessarily. I don't, but I mean, I don't know, what, I don't know what the question it. was, though. So one of these, I believe, four or five criteria under that <laughs> ordinance, and one of them is that um, using a hotel address as your personal address on any government form constitutes the establishment of a residency at that hotel. 
which is against the ordinance. Sorry. Okay, so so I don't know the language that you're speaking of, but I will tell you that you know there are these hierarchies of laws. We talk about preemption, and you know there may be an ordinance that says that. I I don't know, but. When it comes to determination of residency, there are many statutes, state statutes, whether it be for income taxes or federal statutes, income tax purposes, for voting purposes, for, you know, all of those, there are many criteria that determine residency. And I would say that um, those would probably take priority over a land use enforcement ordinance and, and how that is defined for that purpose. Because residency, believe it or not, is defined somewhat differently depending upon the context in which that definition arises. I, I would just ask us to review <coughs> that ordinance and to take a look at that portion of it. <clears throat> um, I was happy to hear that the Board of Selectmen is looking, looking, or I should say the select board, seems how it's not all men, <laughs> um, is looking at uh, different ways of, of handling the issue and, and looking at different ordinances and so forth. Um, if I am correct, and I could be completely wrong, but I tried to find in the zoning ordinances anywhere that <coughs> home, where homeless shelters, an actual homeless shelter, are they allowed in any zone in the community? I don't think the homeless shelter specifically. No, that's, a, that's not a defined use. Uh, we define dwelling units, we define hotel rooms. Cottages, those all have definitions. There is no definition that would match that exactly. So, so by default, does that prohibit them from the town? Under every section of uses, there's a, a line at the bottom that says if it's not listed above, it's not an allowed use. Okay. So uh, I guess my next question is, and there's some reason for me asking this. Um, <clears throat> We have nonprofit agencies who are perking up all over the place, and there's for profit shelters companies that are out there that are not good companies for the most part, from what I've been able to discern. Um, and of course, the municipal and county wide, whatever shelters um, that already exist. Nobody wants to see a shelter in their neighborhood. I, I, I know that, okay? But the my point in all of this is that at some point, somebody is going to raise the potential of doing that. And do my question is, do you have any sort of fallback conditional requirements? Um, I, as you stated, it's it's not if if that's a specific use mm -hmm. that it's currently not allowed. Um, there's been no discussion on adding it as a use to the ordinance. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, that could be something the town looks at, but currently there's, there's no provision for it or no discussion on adding it either. If you add it to a, a defined zone, does that then automatically protect other zones from conditional uses? Yes, well, it, it, it wouldn't be a conditional use. We don't have a category for that. But if we created a definition for it and we allowed it in a zone in the town, then in, just in that one zone it would be allowed. And it would never be allowed elsewhere. Yep. It seems and all like land use issues go to the town vote voter approval. Also, it becomes a building issue, too. What is the building being utilized as? And that would probably fall under a certain code of maybe board and care or, or excuse me, a boarding home or something like that. So it becomes, it has its own code for how a building is being used. It's also not... And, and many of you, I'm sure, have been seeing the news out of Portland about trying to figure out, like, where do you place a shelter? Portland is begging the communities around the, the around Portland to please consider having their own shelters. But the um, placement of homeless shelters is really needs to be very carefully and thoughtfully done. And, and Wells is not a community that, that we don't have public transit. We don't have highly walkable areas. We don't have um, we don't have access to the. Um, court systems and social services that are concentrated in places like Portland and Saco Bid, right? So there's, it is, it is an, un, I cannot foresee any time in the next certainly five years and even 10 years where that would even become a discussion. This is just not a place where there would be interest in creating a homeless shelter for the area. I'd like to 
agree with you, but I'm not sure that I can, given the influx of people into Southern Maine, the fact that there's already a deficit of 20,000 housing units in Southern Maine, and the fact that we're getting disbursement of asylum seekers and immigrants all the time. I, I'm not sure that I can agree that it's not going to affect all of the towns. And I guess I'm a person who wants to be more proactive. So I, I, my last question, and I promise it'll be my last, is has the town looked into joining with other communities, perhaps at a countywide level, to help fund a homeless shelter that would be appropriate and surrounded with the right services. So just with what Larissa said, I just wanted to add too, you have different types of homeless shelters. You know, you have some just for families. You have some just for mothers and children. You have some just for men. So there's a whole big intricate thing once you go to, to talk about shelters. Um, the structure has to be, you know, code compliant and things like that, plus transportation. Plus, a lot of shelters provide, you know, emergency medical care on site. So I think all these things are huge and belong in a city because they have the resources. To, to your question, though, yes, we that's why we have York County has a homeless shelter, okay? Right. So, um, and the York County commissioners are discussing right now, they have $40 million in ARPA funds. They're talking about how to use those funds. Um, one of the options in front of them that they're considering is um, using part of that money to fund an expansion of that homeless shelter because there is such clear and evident need, as well as um, possibly using money to expand their substance abuse disorder um, housing that they have, which is so we as communities pay county taxes that then fund this kind of county-wide um, effort. York County has not had the same um, regional conversations that Cumberland has surrounding homelessness. So when I was serving in um, Scarborough, I had the great opportunity to go in and be part of some of those meetings. Cumberland County is being a little bit more... Um, proactive to the word that you were using, but in part because Portland is the central hub of homelessness in Maine. I mean, homelessness is across Maine in every town, but its concentration in Portland makes it an immediate need, and Portland has done a really great job of trying to facilitate conversations with the surrounding communities to address homelessness in a more regional way. York County managers, I can say, have not. Okay, We certainly talk about the need for and wanting to see county government step forward and take the lead on that conversation, expand the shelter that they already have in place, and, and really do see it as a, as a regional county initiative, not a town by town. And can you provide a name, phone number for an individual at the county level? Um, at the, for the county shelter? <laughs> not at the shelter. Um, county government? The decision makers, yes. Yep, so there's the, there is a York County manager. His name is Greg Zinser, Z-I-N-S-E-R. There are also commissioners that represent the different districts. Uh, we do have one here in Wells. Uh, you can, they should all be on the county website. Yeah. Yeah. All the, yeah. They have their email addresses and everything. Um, uh, our district representative, District 5, is uh, Richard Clark. Very good. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions? There's none. We can go back to the, the list of questions that we have, and then some more people come up with questions as we go. Just um, we'll, we'll get back to members of the public. Um, so I think um, <laughs> town manager is up with. I, I think I've actually visits? answered this one okay. based on a public. But yeah, it's a, are there any follow up visits by um, York County Community Action, State DHHS, um, Maine Housing, Social Services? The answer is no. You know, not unless while in. Um, discussions at the YCCAC level, a, a need is shared. At that point, the social workers that are, are part of YCCAC do do their best to connect in, but there is not a consistent system. There's no social workers assigned to, these, to an individual. And the next question we answered about social services and how this is simply a funding mechanism versus a, a true program which would incorporate all of the social services necessary. Um, but then the question after that is, should we change our moniker from the friendliest town in Maine to the most crime-ridden town in Maine? Um, I don't think that's accurate. Uh, 
and I don't think it's good for business. I think Eleanor is here and thinks she would say that it would not be a good moniker. But so no, there's no plan to change that. Um, Leah, I think the next one's for you. Gates, right? <laughs> yes. All right, Gates. So um, the answer depends on whether we're talking. Oh, I'm so sorry. Are we allowed to gate the roads leading to our neighborhoods? and to install cameras on telephone poles. So with respect to gating roads, depends on private, public. So if it's a public road, the answer is absolutely not. If it is a, um, a private road with a public easement, meaning that either the road has been discontinued or <coughs> bottom line, the public still has a right to travel over it, you can't, a private party cannot um, do that. With respect to a private road, however, if it is a private road, then I think that um, there is the capacity and the ability to do that, except, and I think Chief Putnam and um, Fire Chief are going to say, uh, we need knocks boxes. We need to make sure that um, you can't just gate even a private road because emergency access has to be uh, available for obvious reasons. Um, also, I think there, and this is really geeking out, but I think it's important for people to know <laughs> that if it's a subdivision and there's been a subdivision approval, that would probably require an amendment to a, an amended plan. Um, Mike, I bet you have some, any, any, I know we talked about this. Am I missing anything? Yes. Yeah, so if it's a private street, which most of the new subdivisions that are being developed in town are private streets, um, part of the review criteria for planning board is, uh, so safety measures, fire, truck access, EMT, police access. So part of that subdivision approval, if it was to be altered to add a, a gate system, then that would have, need an amendment to that subdivision approval. And also make sure that if it's in the, pr the they're, you know, entering into, there would probably be some town right-of-way issues on the entrance, so that would just be another issue. And with respect to the telephone issue, can we put cameras on telephone poles? I'm not sure who we is, but let's say it's public, uh, it's private individuals putting things, cameras on, on telephone poles. Telephone poles are not owned by the town. They are private property. They're owned by the utility. So I'm going to go out and tell you, don't, don't do that, um, unless you want the private property owner to have take exception to that. Um, if it is a question about whether the town can mount security cameras on private property poles, Again, it's the same issue. I know um, there have been agreements in the past, I'm not saying in this town, but just from a municipal perspective, that that has been um, over the years allowed. But you can imagine, I'm sure, that there are some serious constitutional issues with respect to search and seizure, right to privacy. And so, again, uh, across the country, cases are if it is. Um, if you have a reasonable expectation of privacy, wherever that camera is trained, then um, I, I think it needs to be very, very careful. The cases where it has been said okay is when the, the camera or the, the area being looked at is very much a public space. It's on a, pro a, a public way and could be seen. This notion you probably heard about the curtilage of a, of, of a place. So the answer is if it's a private party, don't do it. And most likely, the town can't do it either. Chief, did I miss anything? No. Okay. I totally agree. Okay. <coughs> uh, Next one it. is for the town manager. Uh, do GA, quote, residents, unquote, have health care? Maybe. I, again, you can qualify for GA and have health insurance. You can qualify for GA and receive Medicare. Or um, So that's not a question. That's not a criteria for assessing somebody for GA. Um, they also may well not have health care. Um, and... But that there isn't, health care is not one of the things that you qualify for with GA. There's no health insurance payments being made through the GA system. Next one's for you. Okay. Um, next question is, does <clears throat> Maine have drug courts where substance abusers have the choice of jail or substance abuse treatment monitored by the court? And if they drop out of the program or do not pass random drug testing, they are remanded to jail. So this question is is partially correct. There is absolutely a, a drug court mm -hmm. where um, folks who are have, have committed a crime which are somewhat related to their drug issues, substance issues, can be diverted away from the regular court process into the, this drug treatment court. And they're pretty rigorous requirements, um, one of which is regular um, ran random drug, drug testing, and I think they multiple mm -hmm. times a week, okay? So that is definitely a program. The question here also asks, um, is it a choice between jail and substance, uh, th this, this drug court? Um, I 
think it's important to understand that this program gets instituted before somebody, before there is a trial, right? So there aren't, it's not a choice about whether you go to jail or not. It's a choice whether you want to go through the regular process and maybe end up in jail or go through the drug court process, which is rigorous, lots of meetings with the judge and parole officers and police officers and treatment um, uh, people who have expertise in that area. So it's not a either you do this or you go to jail, but that might be the practical upshot. So the second question is, if they do not pass a random drug testing, um, are they remanded to jail? Well, as I said, they weren't necessarily going to jail in the first place. But if they um, don't test, you know, if they fail the test, then they can be, uh, the program is no longer available to them. Is that right, Chief? Is there anything yeah. else to add? Yeah, they, uh, they, if to go into drug, drug court, you have to sign a contract with <coughs> men. There's, there's consequences throughout that. You have to admit the allegation. Yes, and you so have that's to plead a precondition. Guilty. You have to plead guilty. You have to plead guilty. You're remanded to drug court. Um, and I think it's at least a year, I believe. Is the, the, the program. The yeah. program is at least a year. And if you fail that program, you uh, if you drop out, uh, you will reoffend, or you just don't complete it, then you go back to court and you face some of the options that you were given to begin with as a sentence. That could be a fine. It could be jail, highly unlikely, and uh, or something other that you, you work out with the district attorney's office. So jail is not a definite thing. Next one is for town manager. Yeah. Is there an informational cross-agencies network between counties that would share specific information regarding available housing as well as red flags as to issues such as thefts? No, but wouldn't that be lovely? Um, the, the answer is just no. That there is uh, very, very little inter-county cooperation that I have ever noticed, and not because people are not well-intended, and not because we are not, of course, all one state, but just because that is not how our county government is set up. I will say that the uh, some of the motel owners have been. Uh, you might be able to speak to this. Motel owners have formed a an email group, yes. and they will send names. It's, and it's worked out very well. Absolutely. Am I correct there? It's absolutely. And I know some local hotels have also created a Facebook page in yep. which they've coordinated that same effort. So, yep. so it's, it's working out well. Again, cooperation from our business owners is yes. great. The next two are for you, Chief. I thought, oh, am I? No, no. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, I gotta find a question. You want me to read a what, uh, what is the lawful and suggested way to address a confrontation with, with these people, especially those that are walking Rottweiler dogs. Very scary. That feels so, very specific, Tifa. <laughs> I know. Very specific. And we did have an incident. But uh, I'm not sure exactly what they mean by these people, but uh, if you're referring to the people that are housed in this pro program. Situation. Um, <laughs> situation. Uh, but... In my opinion, no one should confront anybody if you're not comfortable in confronting people. You don't know what you're going to face. You don't know what their reaction is going to be. So um, unless you are you're very comfortable doing it and are trained to deal with whatever you may encounter because you don't know how they're going to react, then call us and let us deal with it. That's what your taxes dollars go for is to us to take care of these things, not yourselves. You know, I don't want to see anybody get hurt. Um, you know, for all you know, the guy says, Bite or any bites, or, you just don't know. Unfortunately, and I know the incident that I believe we're speaking about here, I give the lady uh, kudos for doing it, you know, uh, on, a, you know on, a, on a street all by herself, a guy uh, walking three wild dogs. I couldn't believe she told me that what she did. But we had a good conversation afterwards about how maybe she should do it next time and <laughs> how things worked out. But uh, it it works out. But again, if you're not comfortable doing something, don't do it. You, you know, you're kind of crazy if you do. Let us do it. Chief That's Mata, what we're trained for. Can you please make clear, though, there wasn't an incident in which somebody that was living in these hotels was walking their dogs and confronted someone with the dog? No, 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 no. He was out walking three Rottweilers. She was out walking her dog, and she didn't like the way he was treating the dog, so she confronted him. So I just want to be clear that we don't have, we have not had an issue with somebody who is no, no, living no, in one of the hotels, no, no, confronting no. people on the sidewalk with no, their dogs. That no. is, no. don't start rumors. Don't. St <laughs> no. 
hotels, pet friendly hotels. And I believe I answered this next one already. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and then, so the next one. So it doesn't have that. Is that? Yeah. Excuse me, does that mean? Yeah. It seems as though folk. Phone call, that one? Yep. Yep. It seems as though phone call volume must be spiking as population grows. During the 24-hour time frame, is there always two dispatchers on? Uh, the answer is no. From 2 a.m. to 10 a.m., uh, there's only one. During the summer months, uh, or our peak season here, we do try to hire a call taker uh, for them to become certified in all the things that the full-time dispatchers do. Uh, the summer would be over. So they uh, answer the call. They don't do EMD, that's emer emergency medical dispatching, EFD, emergency fire dispatching. Uh, again, that's weeks away from the desk. So it, by the time we did it, they'd be summer would be over. So we do uh, uh, do hire a call taker, which has uh, over the last couple of years been increasingly difficult. It's a uh, Again, as we all see, I'm sure the local motel is finding help now is you're not the only ones in that boat. We're in that boat too. Uh, so we had, it is has become very tough to uh, find someone uh, to be able to do that, and they have to, they do have to have you know a very um, I mean they may have, they need to be able to do five things at once, and it's tough to find those people. Let's see. So the second half of the question is, if not, how many more would the department need uh, to always have two staffed? Technically, 1.5. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> kind of tough to do that, so two would be great. Uh, as a, um, Technically, the 1.5, but ideally two as a mandatory, as mandatory quality assurance and uh, CGIS uh, auditing has been done by paying overtime. So having two more people would allow that to be done at, at straight time. Uh, it, would, it, may, it would also allow us to have a supervisory position within the dispatch unit itself. So that's, I know we just added one. That was great. Um, that helped a lot. And we were lucky we found a, a great young man to fill that position and he's, uh, yeah, he's doing a great job. So he's, you know, so that's good. but. Again, with the increase uh, in uh, full-time year-round residents, the increase in calls for service, uh, again, it, policing has changed over the years. I think you may, I think I stole this from uh, Captain Shabbat, but we've become community caretakers. And it's a totally different role than when I started 35 years ago. It's, you know, and I will tell you, it, it, policing has changed. It's... Uh, much more concentrated, you know, it's the aging of Maine, and there's just so many, especially with the, the closing of our, some of our mental health facilities, you know, we, you know, we've become, you know, psychologists, you know, sociologists, we've become everything, you know, and, uh, and again, we want to be there to help everybody in whatever need they have. So, calls have increased dramatically. Captain Chapman's back. Call during 70, 76,000 times this, month. this year. That's a lot. That's a lot. Chief Putnam, though, can you please reassure the public what happens if, oh, what, during 2 a.m. to 10 a.m., if somebody is already called the dispatch, if, what happens with the done? Yeah, if they're doing that, we do have a ring over. There's a fail safe. Don't worry, your phone's going to get answered. Um, but, uh, yeah, but I'd like us to answer it. That's important to me, and I think that's important to the residents of, of, of Wells, that you have that personal touch. Uh, <coughs> when you call and say, you know, I live... I live by the dragon on 9B. I know where that is. If you call, if you have, if someone in, you know, say Scarborough or whatever, not Scarborough, but uh, the state police barracks or something, they're going to have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Zero. But so, we are going to get our people there. We are going to oh, figure yeah. it out. Oh, we'll they get find there. that dragon. They get there. They find the dragon. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, <laughs> so that's, uh, that's my pitch for adding more people. But thanks. <laughs> thanks for that opportunity. <laughs> um, uh, what is the next one for you? Week. But I think it's answered. Yeah, it's so, times. Leah, if we Which can one? to you. Sure. Okay, forgive me. Given this is a long one, so I'm going to just read it and answer best I can. 
Um, if the innkeepers who sign into this housing program are paid by <laughs> county, state, or federal government to house people in need, then why can't the county, state, or federal government institute a series of strict rules associated directly with the housing program, such as, but not limited to, a far less stringent, but I believe equally effective as a person in the criminal justice system who is out on parole or house arrest with an ankle bracelet. I'm not suggesting homeless all the homeless all be treated like convicts, but I am suggesting that there be some kind of accountability run by this county, state, or feds, which would require a series of rules where individuals in this program would be subjected subject to unannounced county, state, or federal visits by social services or having certain hours of accountability where individuals on this program would have to check in with and account for all of their time if or when they leave the hotel premises or if and when they receive visitors, that prior permission is given for any visitors and a stipulation and strict enforcement as to the length of stay of any such visitors and visitors con and visitors' conducts while on the premises. Okay. Unpack that. Thank you. Yeah. I am going to try my very best to unpack that. So, a um, couple of things. State, federal, and uh, county government. If they are administering a program, they have the right to prescribe rules with respect to that program. That said, all of those rules must... We talked about preemption, right? The overarching law is the Constitution of the United States and the, the, the state of Maine, right? And so all rules, regulations that this this body enacts state level have to be consistent with the Constitution. And underst I, I understand the concern around some of the um, mechanisms suggested here and why they're being suggested, but I do have to say that I think they would run afoul of some constitutional uh, issues. So... That is not to say that if some of the folks who are living in these uh, the hotels are in fact on parole or on probation, then those kinds of restrictions can certainly be imposed. However, um, what I'm seeing here with this funding mechanism, a funding program, is simply that, is that if you are a guest in a hotel, if you are a tenant in any, you know, um, apartment, your landlord and the hotel owner cannot impose restrictions on visitation, cannot make you kind of sign in and out and account for your um, whereabouts. And so I think that what's being proposed here is, is legally problematic. Thank you. Uh, next one is for town manager. Sounds like we're talking about workfare. We yeah. sure are. Are GA residents required to work or look for work in order to obtain benefits like housing? Yes, but no. So if you if somebody first comes to the town and they qualify for GA, we are required to provide them with that GA at their first visit to us. Now, the town of Wells has in its GA ordinance a work fair requirement. So should the person be of sound mind and body and therefore able to perform work, we can require that they perform a certain number of hours of work Okay, and when we say work, what we really are saying is community service that we um, assign in order to qualify the following month. So, no, you do not need to have performed work on our behalf in order to receive housing assistance the first time. Nor do you have to have sh do you have to show to us that you are currently seeking employment in order to receive assistance the first time. We can insist and do insist that you should, providing you are of sound body and mind. And I think that that's really important. It serves no one if somebody comes in and they are eligible financially for general assistance and they simply are unfit to work, to insist that they do so. That, that is not a path that um, we have chosen to take. But if they are able to be looking for work, we do require that they look for a certain number of jobs each week and they have forms that they fill out to show that that has happened. Okay, that are signed off by the people that they have applied to jobs with. Um, and that is a prerequisite for applying for assistance the following month. So first month, if you meet the financial requirements, you will receive assistance. But subsequent months will be dependent on work fair and search, uh, search for employment. 
All right, the next one is, if it's helpful for hotels to have people in winter, could they take Afghan asylum seekers who would have lots of social services, support from the government, veterans, Catholic charities, and church volunteers to help these families who helped us in Afghanistan? Uh, the answer is yes. There's there's no reason why they couldn't. Uh, I don't think the town really has anything to do with that one. Yeah, but, no it's, but yes, the answer is yes to that. Um, next one's for you. As we get closer to tourist season <coughs> and contracts are not renewed, where will the recipients live? How do the agencies involved monitor the needs and activities of those needing help but no available communication? I'm not quite sure what's meant by that last part, but let's address the first one. So as Chief Putnam has um, already said, in, in the relationships that she has fostered with the hotel owners that are currently um, housing folks, they, there is a mixed review about whether or not they can intend to continue to offer housing into the summer months. I believe that we have one hotel owner that does plan to do so, and we have one hotel owner that doesn't really plan to do so unless they are somebody who has been a real good um, community member and maybe could even provide some, some employment help to that um, hotel. So, but I think that the first part of this question that's really important to highlight is, and contracts are not renewed. There are no contracts. So it is up to each individual hotel owner or landlord to decide if they wish to continue to provide housing that is paid for through the ERA. Um, and where, if they don't choose to do so, where will the recipients live? That's a really great question. And it's certainly one that the folks at YCCAC are preparing for and, and know that it, that's coming. That's not as desperate as it was November, December, because Maine actually happens to be a very comfortable place to live outside during the summer months. It's never ideal. We do not wish for people to be living outside, but it doesn't become as desperate a, um, a social emergency as the wintertime months. Um, the, the short answer is we don't know where they will choose to, to seek out housing. But because of how the ERA works, it will be uh, the responsibility of each individual person to find their new housing. All right, the last written question that we have is for Chief Button. I want to close it out. Sure. Uh, since the implementation of, of this program, how many times has the Wells Police Department been called to these four uh, hotels? Um, so between all four, it's, we have 192 calls for service at those establishments. The On top of that, once uh, we found out there's, we were having these issues, and, we, and I talked about it earlier about a, you know, a concentra concentrated presence at some of these places. What we do is we have de we, what we call details. These details, like uh, another question came out, when you, when you go away for a week, we do a detail for your address. So what we did is we created a detail for the four establishments. So on top of the 192 uh, calls for service at these establishments, there were... Uh, just shy of 300 times the buildings were checked on in four months. Between That's November 1st to uh, the end of February. And actually, I think really this, the, it came to light probably mid-November. Mid, uh, so I'm not exactly sure when we started those uh, details, but that's, uh, again, that was our way of trying to help combat some of the issues that we've been having, we've been seeing, and we've been hearing about. We do those details. But yeah, so it's 192 plus all those details that we did uh, for a grand total of 484 times we were at or around those establishments, trying to keep an eye on things. That's all we have for written questions. If there are any last remaining questions from anyone in the public, they can feel free to come up to the podium. How many people are you talking about? How many people involved in, in both general assistance and ERA? Where they came from. I don't so know the number of that. We don't have a solid number on how many people. That there's, there's not a mechanism that YCCAC has to track that. That was a question that was asked in the first round. Um, in part because, because it's an individual relationship, the, the people can be moving from place to place. So there's not a... Um, there's not a good way to solidly identify that. What we do know, and uh, Chief Putnam mentioned, at one of the hotels, for instance, we're down to 25 people living at that hotel, um, down from a high of 40 earlier in the winter. Um, and that is, our, I think, one of our more heavily populated spaces. Um, and where they are coming from is almost entirely York County. Okay, so um, the, the folks that are part of this 
um, this program. Uh, mm -hmm. They are, uh, according to YCCAC, the majority of them are actually coming from Sanford. And then there are folks from other um, towns in York County as well. But this is a York County based um, population. The majority of them. Or they have people that have come to <clears throat> York County. Right. Uh, we had the opportunity to speak to a couple of individuals today that were actually from Florida. That, but they'd come up and they'd land in, in the area. So York County Community Action um, will house if you're, from, you know, if you're from away and you find yourself homeless here. So um, the majority of them, though, like you said, are, are York County residents. I believe we ran into one that was from Portland area, but that was, again, the re good reason for it was escaping, trying to get away from an abusive relationship. So there's, you got to remember there are uh, other factors that go into this, these decisions, and that's important to hear. Helena, could you confirm the four hotels that you guys are alluding to? <laughs> sure. Um, I'll start uh, on the north end, go south. It's the USA Inn, the Beaches, Near Beach Motel, and Majestic Regency. But I thought the Beaches was closed down because they weren't allowed to be open during the winter. No, nope, they're open. A month ago, it's determined that they go oh, really. to their site. Oh, really? And you can remember, some of these places are not open to the public. They're only open to accommodate people in this program. That's still open to the public. Well, because they don't take people off the street. You can't go there. You, you can't. That, 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 was, that didn't sound good. <laughs> That's an oxymoron. But no, you can't. You can't go in off the street and rent a room. Yeah. So I think that the 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 core of the question is, and and Jodine addressed this a little bit earlier. We know that there are a couple of facilities that have been having people living on site that when we dug up their site plans from the 1980s, they shouldn't have been, okay? But because we we have now, our second intern starts tomorrow to make sure that this project is completed on, you know, in the time frame that we gave, our intention is to have the thorough inventory of all site plan, um, you know, rules that are assigned to each of the 28 commercial hotels that are in the town of Wells. Each of those hotels will be receiving a letter um, late spring, early summer of this year, saying these are the rules that are assigned to your hotel. And as of October 15th or whatever of 2022, we will be enforcing these rules. Okay. And that will be a letter that will be going out to all hotel owners. We are taking this as an opportunity to put at the top of the priority list, identifying what are the rules that govern each of these properties and now starting to enforce those rules. So that hopefully will stop this from happening next year. Not, not necessarily. No. no. But at least they know their guidelines. So what other steps can be taken to preempt this? When was the program was extended until it was just extended, wasn't it? I thought it was October. October. That's what I thought. I mean, it's really based on the individual, like you said, it's between the individual and the hotel. Well, even if it's not the emergency rental assistance program, that doesn't mean that there will not be, as one of our speakers said before, we are short, based on all of the housing studies, 20,000 units of housing. So to Eleanor's question and Jodine's kind of answer, some of these hotels are not actually required to be closed during the winter. Okay, and so there, if you are not required to close in the winter and you choose to partner with some form of social service service agency to provide housing, then, then that's going to be what that personal property owner decides to do. Um, I think we'll be in a much better position to address the concerns as they come, because we'll be prepared next time. It won't surprise us. But the of the four hotels listed, they are all not, not all of them are required to close during the winter. Okay, so um, <coughs> there, there is no way to insist that they do so. They were approved for their site plan to be allowed to house, to, to be able to let their rooms during the winter months. Um, so that, that's, I think, what, you know. And, and not all people, there's one establishment that I'm thinking of, not all the people at establishment are on, are on or utilizing this 
these funds. There is, we had one, there was a, a visiting, uh, not a visiting nurse, what do you call them? Traveling Traveler. nurse, traveling nurse, staying at one of them. And another one was uh, people working on the solar projects. So there are other people staying at at least one of the establishments. I think that's it. Um, the others are all for the, uh, on the situation. <laughs> Aaron? Just a quick, I want to, the understanding for me is that when I've been reading some of the police blogs on Facebook, that there's been a lot of trespassing. So those are the people trying to re-enter into the hotel units that... No, what, okay, what that... Um, big question. Yeah, yeah I'm just good question. Where they go, are you re-arresting them because they're back on the property, or are you just letting them leave back into the community? No, what... Uh, the agreement we have with um, one of the hotel owners is if he if he wants them removed or we have a situation with them, he wants them trespassed from their property. He doesn't want them back there. And that's good because all they're doing is causing trouble when they're there. So we serve them criminal trespass notice. If they do go back, they can be arrested. Uh, however, if sometimes if they go back, he tries to take care of himself so that, again, it's, n it's not another burden on the, on the criminal justice system either. Right. I just... Because when, when they leave yep. by them, they're pretty angry. Yeah. And my business is like a quarter of a mile away. <laughs> so it seems to me that yep. they do need to get the police involved in every time and that they're asking someone to leave that property. Because yep. those people are not happy people. No. And normally when they leave, uh, the motel has been very good. He knows they have a ride coming. He waits for the ride to show up. He'll pay for an Uber to come get him and take him away. So he's been very helpful and very accommodating. So yeah, and I believe we've spoken about the issue. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I hate to say this. I've had to buy pepper spray, yep. taser. I mean, I'm directly involved in that area, and there is a lot of drug use going on. I mean, I'm sorry. You just can't call a time. It's, it's scary. No, and I understand that, and that's why I offered the service of right. when you're going into work early right. in the morning that I would have an officer go down and, and enter the building with you. Yeah. And I think that's another community service that I think is important. Yeah, I, that's a great service, but it it's it's difficult during the daytime yeah. when they're entering from McDonald's to Subway and they're walking around talking to the trees. I'm sorry, a lot. <laughs> trees, grass, snow. Everybody and, needs someone to talk to. And it, it's just a little, it's a little scary. And, yes, and it can be. And it, it's just hard to pick up the phone every time. I mean, no. I don't know how many, you know. Yeah. No, I understand. I mean. And you, the same as the drug use, there's a lot. So, there's a lot. Some of the people that are talking to the trees and the grass and stuff like that, it's not just drug use. No. We have a large larger population than normal of people with mental health issues. And it's not just in that area. It's, it's, it's all over. And they do talk to themselves and everything else. Not saying there's not drugs here in Wells, no, but are. saying there's, there's some other extenuating circumstances also. And it's well, I mean, regardless, they come regardless, people, it's scary. Guys, I mean, yeah. Regardless of what the, the reason is, it's scary. it is unnerving. Yeah. It is scary. It is. I, I yeah. mean, I worked and, in New York County Community Action yeah. for 10 years. I, I, I've seen it. Yeah. yeah. Nowadays, you don't know if somebody's actually just got earbuds. They're talking to somebody on the and other that happens too. That too. And then I saw that today with a guy running down the street. Yeah. He was singing and having a grand old time. And I could, but it made me turn and look. Yeah. Well, someone's talking to themselves. I said, well, maybe I'll go check it. But there's just a guy jogging down the street having a grand old time singing a song. <laughs> you know, to each his own. But, oh, Nora, did you have another question? Yeah, just one thing. You know, um, with this uh, influx of the uh, police calls and things like that, um, can there be some sort of a, a system that if there's uh, over so many per week that you start charging the property owner? Well, and that's and that's where the nuisance ordinance uh, would come in. If it's something, uh, a, you know, a road the town wants to go down, a select board wants to go down. And uh, again, you know, I think a lot of this is already going to be taken care of. Uh, and we may want the, that on the books because it doesn't necessarily just go for a motel. It can go for a house or an or, or Airbnb yeah. where we keep having problems and uh, because they're absent landlords. But uh, And that may be, and I don't know if well, yeah, there, you've there seen are, some of those. There's several. Yeah, I mean, certain towns have what's called disorderly structure ordinances, yep. those kinds of things. 
Uh, so it's certainly something that we can look into as well. Yeah, and there and there are. I mean, they're locally too. I think it was Bitterford. I don't know if that's right. Wyndham. Sanford had one. I don't know. Yeah. How strict they uh, are on it. South Portland. But apparently, South Portland's. I guess. Kind of. I think it was. Is it Mal? The the reporter. He uh, he was the one that came down and spoke to us, and now he's the one doing the story in South Portland. So I think some of the things we had here have brought to light uh, things in other towns, and I think people are taking notice, and I think that's important that uh, the things are going to be addressed. And again, it's a global problem. It's not just here. Sally. Make a comment. Um, years ago when this all started changing the conduct, um, new rules were set, et cetera. What had happened prior to that, my observation was that most were small businesses run by families. People were on their property and they took care of their situations. That's kind of the main way to take care of things. You still need the police for other things. You need ambulances, you need fire, but you took care of your area. Now we've gone to the point where, and my, my direct next door neighbor used to have an on-site person there for the condo 50 units round the clock. Now they leave, they come at nine in the morning, they leave at four or five, six o'clock in the afternoon. There is nobody on the property in charge. And to me, this is if you get nuisance calls and things could get right out of hand pretty quick because there's sure. 50 people renting there. They go out, have a good time, maybe invite everybody from the bar back to their place. No one's watching. Um, nobody's watching. Nobody can go down and say, hey, out. <laughs> but if the police are involved, then I, that's why I would support these nuisance calls because I think we might see more of that. I also am a neighbor to an Airbnb. Yep. And sometimes there are 20 cars at a single residence. Now, if they have bothered us because we're nine to fivers, well, we're, we're six to fours. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we live there, we go to bed early, we, do, we have a normal, boring food life. And they'll come along and they're having a great time for the week that they're there. But sometimes it's, it's a nuisance. This Airbnb sure. thing, thing going on, bonkers. Um, and I rent, but I also live next to the place that I rent to, and they're year-round rentals. <laughs> the, uh, if there's more than a few cars there that are supposed to be accommodated by the driveway, it's against the Airbnb's policy. Yeah. Well, these people are doing it themselves, oh, but right. we yeah. have Airbnb, yeah. but I do think that nuisance thing would be it's something to look something at. To look at. Mm -hmm. And I also think, I did see one uh, unit one condo thing come back to, I don't know if it was the board or the town or whatever, to get relieved of their on-site duty people in an attempt to save money. I really think we should discourage them getting, they agreed to that when they built the place. I don't think we should let them off the hook because we have people living amongst this community in various fashions, year-round, just for the week, whatever. And everybody has to have some semblance of their normal. So yep. to the CBA. Totally, totally And this agree. is a nice community, and I'm going to die here. <laughs> so, you know, please, don't, get, don't <laughs> grab me through hell before I go. <laughs> something with the logic committee that most of the people who are renting in town for the Airbnb or privately have registered something with the town so that we know who to contact if there's a problem? I do not think we would say most. No. So voluntary, voluntary. voluntary compliance, it was, it was voluntary, yeah. yeah. It was a good number of total responses, but um, there weren't a lot. There, they weren't all Airbnb. So okay. I think what we've figured out, Katie, was 800. Yeah. 800 I think total. We had probably one seventh or one sixth. Oh, okay. Oh, that one. I thought it was a better response than that. <laughs> <laughs> She's an optimist. Yeah. Any other questions? I had a great one, but it just went out. It went. <laughs> you can always email or call us. <laughs> 
Okay. So in general, have things gotten better? 100%. Oh. No, okay, not 100%. 100%. No, not 100%, but it is a lot better. So, yeah, if I can find it, of because I just put everything away. Over the last uh, couple months, I'm trying to find the first ones that it's it's gone down dramatically for calls for service at the uh, establishments. So uh, uh, I did it out. That's my name. Sorry, I can't find it. But I mean, it went from. Uh, each establishment, I think one went up from, we did November, December, January, and February. And there was a dramatic decrease from uh, November till now. I mean, there was a peak time, but uh, with the cooperation of the uh, owners, the calls for service have gone down to those establishments, have gone down. So eh, I might even left them on my desk. I remember what my question was. <laughs> is there a, a website on the in the Wells County or Wells Police Department or someplace where we can get uh, information as homeowners about the, the crime rates and uh, um, types of crime in in the proximity of their residence? In the proximity of their residence, I can give you crime rates. Uh, UCR Uniform Crime Reporting is for the town. Um, as to a specific neighborhood, we don't have that. Um, I think that that's where the police log comes in when you yeah, read kinda. through. You can see the location that the, the crime took place. Mm -hmm. and um, we, yeah, we don't have that. No, I mean we could probably, if you called and said, you know, here's my address. If you called any calls on the street, I might be able to tell you how many. I can't tell you what some of them are. Of course, as you know, uh, we tend we. I'm a firm believer in not giving out anything on mental health issues or responses. I think that's a, a family issue, a private issue, and I'm not going to do that. Uh, no, I'm not talking question. about domestic things. I'm talking about uh, like burglary, thefts, burglary thefts, assaults. That's what assaults. Yeah. You know, to be honest, I can't tell you. I For 35 years, I can't tell you it's, it's in one spot. It's throughout town. Uh, we can look and see if we can do a, a site. And that's how we got these numbers. We did. They go in by the site, as we call it, and that's how we uh, came up with those numbers. Good question. Sure. It's four properties that you mentioned. How many owners own multiple properties? One owner owns two of them, and the other single. Two. And they have management companies or managers on site. The other two. Yes, five dollars. Thank you very much for doing this this evening. Hello. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you guys for taking an interest in it. It's important to all of us. Careful driving. There is some yes, uh, lovely weather snow. out there. Oh, Have a great night, everyone. Excellent on the turnpike.